Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Sarazzle Dazzle Physics. This is the big video. This is my full GCSE physics revision video. This is everything that I have been teaching in physics for the last 10 years. I've tried to whack it all into one complete video. Right, if you don't know who I am, I'm a qualified UK physics teacher with over 10 years teaching experience and I have a degree in mathematics and physics. I've been teaching full time for the past 13 years or so. So I'm very familiar with the course and how it should be delivered. Right, so we're going to go through the concept in the following order. We're going to look at the energy concept, the electricity concept, particle model of matter, radioactivity, forces, waves, magnetism, and finally space physics. The way you should use this video is the following. So obviously you should watch the video, pause it as required, make your own notes. And if you don't understand something, obviously just comment below and I'll do my best to answer all the queries. If you're still struggling, if you look at the description, I've got topic by topic playlists, yes, and obviously if you click on them, it will have the lessons in bite-sized formats in which I go through the concepts in much more detail. So obviously that might work for you. Right, and you should use this video maybe when you're revising, uh, maybe let's say you're going somewhere but you don't have enough time to pull out your book. Obviously this can be helpful because you can just listen to the content or watch it to refresh your knowledge. Right, let's get started. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so energy and energy stores. Energy can never be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. Energy is measured in joules, capital J. In a closed system, the total amount of energy remains constant. So that means that in a closed system, let's say all the energy coming in is equal to all the energy coming out, it's not gonna change. Right, there are different types of energy stores. Over here on the left-hand side, you'll see a table which has everything in it. We've got the energy stores, description, and some examples of it. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different types of energy stores. Magnetic, internal, chemical, kinetic, electrostatic, elastic potential, gravitational potential, and nuclear. Description, so I'll walk you through an example of each one. Let's say you have two magnets, you put them together, opposite poles. Obviously, that's going to be magnetic energy stored. Internal, let's say you have a kettle, you turn it on, the particles gain kinetic energy, and they're moving around a lot. That will be internal energy. Chemical will be the energy stored within chemical bonds. Kinetic is going to be the energy of any moving object. Electrostatic, let's say you have a two uh, protons. They say protons, they're positively charged. You bring them close together. They want to repel each other away. That's going to be electrostatic energy. Elastic potential, when you compress, let's say, a spring, it will have elastic potential energy stored. Gravitational, if you have an object, you put it into the air, it has the gravitational potential energy of falling down. Nuclear is going to be the energy stored within the nucleus of an atom. So that's going to be nuclear energy over here. Right, now, energy pathways. So right now, look, over here on the right-hand side, I've got an example of a ball falling down. We know that energy can be transferred from one form to another. So over here we have gravitational and we know it's going to be converted into kinetic as it falls. Yes, gravitational at the top, drop it, it becomes kinetic. Obviously to go from here to here, there is a mechanism. This is going to be the pathway. So this one is going to be called mechanical working helps this to occur. Okay, so there are one, two, three, four different energy pathways. And look, here's a description of each one of them. Electrical working is going to be when you have a flow of charge in a circuit. Heating via radiation, that's going to be when you have electromagnetic radiation such as light or radio waves or gamma waves which are travelling, they're transferring energy via electromagnetic radiation. Heating via particles is going to be when you have objects which are gaining energy, let's say or you have a warm object next to a cold one, obviously it's going to be a transfer of energy in that process. And mechanical working is going to be energy transfers via forces such as pulling, pushing or stretching. So look at this one over here, we know it's going to be, this is a force obviously making it to fall down, that's why it's mechanical working over here. The next one, here's our first formula for kinetic energy. All objects have kinetic energy, so kinetic energy is equal to a half times by the mass times by the velocity squared. Okay, and here's our formula, E is equal to a half times by M times by V squared, where M is the mass in kilograms, the velocity is in meters per second, and the energy is in joules. Right, the next thing we're going to talk about is what happens if you were to double the mass or double the velocity, and the effect it has on the kinetic energy of an object. Well, look over here, I've got two different tables. The first one, you can see that I've doubled the mass but kept the velocity constant. Obviously, what happens is the kinetic energy doubles as well. If you plug it in, plug these values in, you'll be able to see that for yourself. And look over here, I've done the reverse. Well, I've kept the mass constant, but I've doubled the velocity. You can see that because the velocity is squared, that we get four times the amount of kinetic energy over here. So doubling the mass results in double the kinetic energy, but if you double the velocity, you end up with four times the kinetic energy. So just make sure that you're happy with that, be a little bit of extra information. 
Elastic potential energy. So let's say we have a spring and we were to put a weight at the end of it, it will extend to a final length F. To work out the extension, I'm going to do F minus L, that will be the extension of the spring, how much is actually gained length over here. To work out the elastic potential energy, I can use the following formula, half times by the spring constant times by the extension squared. So E is equal to a half times by K times by E squared. K is going to be the spring constant. That's basically a measure of how stiff the spring is. Okay, if you look at the units then, energy is in joules, spring constant is newton per meter, and we've got the extension in meters over here. And on the right hand side, I've done a little quick uh, walkthrough. Let's say we have a spring uh, of a spring constant 10 newtons per meter and extends by five centimeters, just plugging it in, half times by 10 times by, careful with this one, convert centimeters into meters, 0 0.05 squared, we'll get this value over here. So make sure you're happy with that. Next one, gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is going to be energy is equal to mass times by gravitational field strength times by the height. E is equal to mg delta h. Uh, energy is measured in joules, mass is in kilograms. Gravity is going to be newtons per kilogram. That will be dependent upon which planet that you're on. Gravity on Earth is always 10. So gravity on Earth is always 10. The height is going to be in meters. And look, in this example, let's say we take a block of 5 kg, we raise it 10, 10 meters into the air. The energy is equal to 5, the mass, times by gravity on Earth, it's going to be 10, times by 10 over here. Yes, because obviously the height was 10, it's going to be 500 joules. All right, so next thing, specific heat capacity. Right, this is a difficult concept. The specific heat capacity of an object is the energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Okay, all right, so it sounds quite complicated, but the basic idea is going to be this. Different objects require different amounts of energy to heat them up, yes? So a very good example at the bottom, I've got uh, the specific heat capacity of water and I've got the specific heat capacity of oil. We can see that specific heat capacity of the water is 4,200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius and the specific heat capacity of the oil is 2,000 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So what does that actually mean? That means that it's going to be much easier to heat up the oil than it is for the water because you've got to put this much energy in you know, to heat up the water compared to this much for the oil over here. And look, my summary statement, the greater the specific heat capacity of a material, the more energy is required to change its temperature. And here's my formula we can use. The energy is equal to the mass times by the specific heat capacity times by the temperature change. E is equal to mc delta theta. Energy is in joules, mass is in kilograms. Specific heat capacity is joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And the change in temperature is degree Celsius. This little triangle stands for the change in temperature over here. And look on the right hand side, I've got an example. A bowl of water of mass 100 grams is heated from 5 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius. Given that specific heat capacity of the water is 4,200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius, calculate the energy transferred. So look, E is equal to mc delta theta. Yes, the mass, convert this into kilograms, 0.1. Specific heat capacity is 4,200 times by the temperature change, which is 45 minus 5, which will be 40. And that will be our answer over here. Okay, so the required practical, how to work out the specific heat capacity of an aluminium block. Here is an aluminium block over here, there we go, and uh, you need the following bits of apparatus. You need a heater to put into the block, thermometer, and then you need a circuit. Uh, a voltmeter is connected around the heater, and an ammeter is connected uh, in series with the heater over here. Right, so the equipment, look, voltmeter, ammeter, power supply, stopwatch, aluminium block, thermometer. These are all the things that you need over here. Uh, method, so you set up the diagram, so you set up the apparatus as shown in the diagram, turn on the power supply, and obviously the heater will start to heat up the aluminium block. Every 60 seconds, you record the voltage, or the potential difference, and the current from here. There we go. So we're going to get the voltage and the current over there. Right, in order to work out the energy, you can use the formula, energy is equal to I times by T times by V. I T V will give you the energy over here. So that's how we do it. Risk assessment, obviously the block starts to heat up. Do not touch the block when you're heating it up. Uh, use uh, heatproof gloves when handling the block. Uh, maybe you place the block on a heatproof mat. The control variables keep the aluminium block the same. Do not change the power supply voltage as well. So you obviously do not change the block throughout the whole thing or the power supply voltage. Right, now regards to results, what we're gonna do? Right, you can plot the following graph then. If you plot temperature on the y-axis and energy on the x-axis, you can see that we've got this line over here going up. We've got this nice line going up over here. Right, so once you've plotted this graph, this is quite difficult. Um, so first of all, look at our formula. 
we can see that energy is equal to mass times by specific heat capacity times by the temperature change. Your task is to work at the specific heat capacity. Well, look over here. If you rearrange this formula, it becomes E divided by M delta theta. And then the gradient of this line, it, what are you doing? It's the change in temperature divided by the change in energy. So that's why you can put that at the bottom over here. So that's why, look, this delta theta over delta E can go into this one over here. So look, we have 1 divided by the mass, and that represents the gradient of the line. There we are. So therefore, if you have a 1 kilogram mass uh, of, the of the actual uh, aluminium block, therefore the specific heat capacity is 1 divided by 1 times your gradient, because obviously the mass is 1 over here. So when you do this uh, experiment in class, you work out the gradient of this line, and the specific capacity will be 1 divided by 1 times by the gradient, which you found out from your practical. Right, power. So power is the rate at which energy is transferred. Power is measured in watts. Okay, so power is measured in watts. So look, we have the following formula. Power is equal to energy transferred divided by time taken. P is equal to E divided by T. Power is measured in watts. Energy is in joules. Time is in seconds over here. There we go. And look, here's an example. If a hairdryer transfers 1,000 joules in 20 seconds, the power of the hairdryer is going to be 1,000 divided by 20. It's going to be 50 watts. Energy transferred is equal to the work done. So also, you might find that you get a small variation in terms of this formula. Uh, power is also equal to work done over time. So power is equal to W divided by T. But still, it has the same units. It's going to be watts is equal to joule divided by seconds over here. Energy efficiency. So uh, to work out the efficiency of an object, you simply have to use the following formula. It's going to be the useful energy out divided by total energy in multiplied by 100 or the useful power out divided by total power in times by 100 over here. And look, we've got this example. Let's say we have a light bulb of 100 joules going in, 80 joules of light coming out, and the heat is 20 joules going downwards. To work out the efficiency, it's useful. 80 divided by 100 times by 100, 80%. You can leave it as a decimal, so you can take it as 80% or 0.8. Both are fine over here. There we go. Right, next one's going to be energy transfers in a system. Obviously, a system is an object or a group of objects. In a closed system, there is no net change in the total energy. Okay, thermal conductivity. So imagine you have a wall with a window in it. First of all, the window will let out more heat through it compared to the wall. Hopefully that makes sense. Look, there's got greater arrows coming out of the window, and look, the wall has less of it, uh, less of those arrows coming out. We can say that the window has a higher thermal conductivity. Yes, so the greater the thermal conductivity of an object, the more the heat can flow through it. And look over here, the thermal conductivity of an object therefore affects the rate of cooling. And look, I've got different materials, brick, steel and glass. We know that the glass has the highest thermal conductivity because the heat can flow through easily. Brick has the lowest. That's the reason why you build bricks around a house to keep the heat in, obviously. Required practical two, part one, investigate the effectiveness of different materials as thermal insulators. So in this practical, we're going to change the type of insulation around a beaker and see which one's going to lose heat at the fastest rate. Right, so it's a really easy practical. The equipment you need is going to be five beakers, five lids, five thermometers, kettle, different insulating materials to wrap around the beakers, rubber bands and uh, stopwatches. Right, so number one, what you're going to do is you're going to get the beakers, put different types of insulations uh, on each one of them. Yes, let's say newspaper, cardboard, bubble wrap, etc. Pour equal amounts of hot water into each beaker. They should be also be the same starting temperature. Uh, and then you let the temperature rise to the highest value, obviously because when you put the thermometers in, the temperature will go up. And then you start a stopwatch, and then as time goes on, you record the temperature on each of the thermometers. And obviously, all the water will cool inside them. But then you'll look at each different uh, type of insulation. You will notice that the temperature change will be different. Risk assessment for this, you must use gloves when handling the hot water or beaker as the heat can scald the skin. Control variables, you can use cans of the same surface area, so you have to use them, obviously. Uh, put equal amounts of water into each beaker. Obviously, put more hot water into one, it wouldn't make the, a fair test. Uh, keep the temperature of the surroundings the same. If you change the temperature of the surroundings, it will change the rate of cooling. Uh, also, you must keep the same thickness of each insulator. So obviously, you can't have one insulation like twice the thickness as another. Okay, so let's say we look at the results, guys. So let's say we plot the graph of temperature versus time for each one of our different types of insulation. Hopefully you can identify that the best insulator will have the le least change in temperature. So look over here, it goes from there to there, it has the least change in the temperature. And obviously the worst insulator will have the greatest drop in temperature over here. So make sure that you're happy with that with regards to your results. 
Next one, required practical two, part two. Investigate the factors that may affect the thermal insulation properties of a material. So I've got one, two, three, four, five different beakers right now, but we're gonna keep the type of insulation the same, but we're gonna change the thickness of it. Okay, so we're keeping, so in the previous practical, we changed the type, we kept the thickness the same, but now we're gonna keep the type constant and we're gonna change the thickness. So in this one, five beakers, five lids, five thermometers, kettle, newspaper, stopwatch, rubber bands. Obviously, same thing again, you put equal amounts of water, you wrap different amounts of the same material on each one. So look, this one's maybe one layer thick, two layers, three layers, four layers thick, but it's the same material right now. And then you put the equal amounts of hot water into each one of them. And yes, you let the temperature rise up to the highest value. Once again, start the stopwatch and then every minute record the temperature. So you're recording the temperature each time uh, as time goes on. Obviously, the temperature will drop for all of them, but some of them will drop faster than the others. The risk assessment, obviously, use gloves when handling the hot water or beaker as the heat can scald the skin. The control variables, use cans of the same surface area and volume. Put equal amounts of water into each beaker. Keep the temperature of the surroundings the same throughout the investigation so it can affect the rate of cooling. Uh, so make sure that you keep the temperature of the surroundings the same. And look at my table of results. We've got time, uh, insulation. We've got no insulation, one layer, two layer, and three layer over here. So we've got one layer, two layer, and three layer. Hopefully you can identify that the results will look like the following. So the beaker with the most layers of newspaper will have the smallest change in temperature. Why? It's the best insulator. Obviously because it's got the greatest amount of layers on it. And the beaker with the least amount of layers of newspaper will have the greatest drop over here. Just like a jacket, yeah? obviously like you may be wearing multiple layers, you're obviously going to lose heat at a slower rate compared to someone with a very thin jacket. It's the same idea. Now, we're going to move on to energy resources. There are two different types of energy resources, non-renewable and renewable. Non-renewable simply means energy resource, once it's used, it cannot be used again. Renewable resources will not run out and therefore can be used again and again. Some examples of the non-renewable are going to be coal, oil, and natural gas, and nuclear. Ren renewable will be solar, wind, geothermal, hydroelectric, tidal, biomass, and wave. Right, so the fossil fuel power stations, coal, oil, or natural gas. So look, fossil fuels are burnt, heats up the water, the water turns into steam. Steam then flows through the turbine, which turn, connected to the generator, which generates electricity. So make sure you're happy with that. Uh, and then the advantages of uh, the fossil fuels is going to be, number one, it's a reliable method of energy production. Fuels can be easily transported. Disadvantages, it's non-renewable. There's a finite amount of the fossil fuels. Coal or natural gas all release greenhouse gases which contribute to global warming. Coal releases nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide which can contribute to acid rain. The greenhouse effect in global warming. So right now, uh, this, this is going to be a disadvantage of using the fossil fuels. Um, the sun's rays, infrared rays, should be able to travel down, hit the earth's surface and be reflected off it. But look, look over here, if you were to burn fossil fuels like cars, they obviously are burning the uh, oil, it produces greenhouse gases. Those greenhouse gases emitted will then form a layer around the Earth. And now this is called a greenhouse gas layer. Now the radiation from the sun, when it hits the Earth and it reflects back upwards into space, it can no longer leave, it reflects back inwards. So the heat is now trapped. And obviously the heat is trapped, that causes the temperature of the Earth to increase. And this is going to be the origin of the global warming over here. Right, so now from here we're going to move on to the different types of renewable energy. So first of all, wind power, giant turbines, hopefully you've seen them, they convert kinetic energy into electrical. The advantages are, number one, it's renewable. Uh, once you've set it up, it doesn't cost that much to keep running. There's no greenhouse gases emitted and it can be installed offshore. Disadvantages, it's unreliable, it may not always be windy. There's a limited locations available, yes? Yeah? So maybe people don't want them in their back garden. There's a large number of them required to produce a sufficient amount of energy. They can also kill birds. It can also spoil the visual landscape. So obviously people don't want them putting up in the countryside because it looks a bit ugly. Some of the people might think of that. Right, solar energy. Using solar cells to absorb the light energy of the sun and convert energy into electrical energy. So obviously here's our solar cells. Advantages, renewable. Once set up has a low maintenance cost. There's no greenhouse gases emitted. Disadvantages, it is unreliable. Limited locations available. Areas of high amounts of sunlight are required. There's a large number required for a sufficient amount of energy production. Uh, and also you need a large amount of surface area available for you to be able to capture the light as well. Hydroelectric power. So first of all, this is really interesting. 
Um, let's say you have a top of a mountain, there's like a reservoir, the water can collect there. Obviously it rains, it collects over there. And then what happens is they build a dam, and here's the dam over here, and it, it stops the water, well it lets the water flow through it, and inside the dam there's a turbine. So as the water drops down, it pushes through the turbine generating electricity. And here, here's a good example of a dam over here. So look, it goes from the gravitational potential energy of the falling water, transfers into kinetic energy as it falls downwards. The advantages of this is going to be it's renewable, once you've set it up, there's low maintenance cost and there's no greenhouse gas emission. Disadvantages though, the dam could break, yes, and obviously the risk of flooding. Construction of the dams can destroy natural habitats, so when you're initially building the dam, you probably destroy loads of animal habitats. Uh, it's high startup cost, so obviously make that in the first place. There's a limited number of locations, so only mountainous regions uh, are suitable. The dams can block migration in the patterns of fish, so fish can't swim upstream, obviously because of the dams in the way. Biomass energy, so the byproducts from forestry, plants and animal waste can be burned to produce heat. So that heat is then used to heat up water and then the turbines and the generator. The advantage is going to be so crops are grown as fuels, so therefore it's going to be renewable. It, the fuel is cheap and readily available because you're planting each time. And although the plants release greenhouse gases, obviously when you burn it, they also take in carbon dioxide when they're growing because obviously photosynthesis is taking place. Uh, disadvantages, it releases carbon dioxide into the environment. Growing large amounts of certain crops will limit the biodiversity. So that means that if you grow a certain type of one crop, yes, obviously it's going to uh, reduce the variation in crops that you will have in an area. There's also a moral obligation because people might also say that uh, we could be using those crops to feed people and it shouldn't be used to produce energy. Nuclear energy is going to be the following. It's the energy coming from the fission, which means the splitting of a nuclear atom producing heat in that process. Advantages are going to be the following. One kilogram of nuclear fuel releases a million times more energy than one kilogram of coal. Uh, no greenhouse gas emission in this whole process. Disadvantages are going to be a risk of a nuclear disaster, therefore the risk of radioactive material being released into the environment. Decommissioning uh, is going to be dismantle. When you're trying to dismantle the nuclear power station once it's finished, it's very expensive and quite dangerous. It's also difficult to dispose of the nuclear waste. And obviously it is also non-renewable. So make sure you're happy with that, the nuclear energy is non-renewable. Once you've used up all the uranium fuel, which is used for nuclear uh, energy, there will not be any more available for us. Geothermal energy, so this is really interesting. They pump cold water down into the ground and the hot rocks heat up the water, turning it to steam, so it comes back up to the surface as steam over here. Um, as you can see, the advantages are it's renewable. It's once you've set it up, low maintenance cost. There's no greenhouse gas emission. Disadvantages is going to be the limited locations available, can trigger earthquakes, drilling underground can sometimes release greenhouse gases as well. So when you drill underground, it can also release greenhouse gases. Wave energy, so these sit on the surface of the water and inside there, the waves come in and they push air through a little turbine which is placed inside there, and that generates electricity. Advantages, it's renewable, no greenhouse gas emission, once you've set it up, there's low uh, cost. Disadvantages, only certain locations only, high initial building costs uh, when you're trying to get it going. Uh, turbines can also then stop the, uh, let's say, boats from traveling, and it's unreliable as you're dependent upon the motion of the waves. Tidal energy is slightly different. So this one, you have the uh, turbine placed in the water right now. So this is the turbine placed on the sea floor. Advantages, it's going to be, it's reliable and predictable as tides are fairly constant. It's renewable. The tidal turbines move relatively slowly, therefore minimal disruption to wildlife. Disadvantages, there's not a large amount of energy produced, a high initial cost to install the turbines, and we're obviously because you're sticking them in the water, certain locations only, they can disrupt the migration patterns of marine life as well. Okay, so static electricity. First of all, let's take a jump and a balloon. Initially, hopefully you can identify that they are both insulators. Yes, so no charge can actually flow through them and they are initially neutrally charged. That means that they have equal amounts of positive and negative charge. So look, the jumper is positive over here, and negative, equal amounts, they cancel each other out, and the balloon as well, free positive, free negative, they are both neutrally charged because they also cancel out over here. But if you were to rub them both together, what happens is charge can be transferred from one form to another. So look, you can see that the uh, balloon has gained these negative charges over here, which are the electrons and the jumper over here has lost the electrons to the balloon. So the object which loses the electrons becomes positively charged, and the object which gains electrons becomes negatively charged over here. 
Right, so now look, this one is positive and then this one is negative. So they've now become charged. And this is the origin of static electricity because now they've both become charged. The charge is not free to flow and therefore it's stuck on the balloon and it's stuck on the jumper over here. Right, so now from here we're going to do the following. We can now hopefully explain why a balloon, if you take it and you rub it against like a jumper, why it can stick to a wall. So over here, let's say the balloon, we charge it and obviously it's negative charge. And then you were to place it next to a wall over here. Hopefully we can see that look. What happens is within the wall, uh, the negative charges get repelled away. Obviously because these ones are negative, they repel these ones away. And therefore the positive charge attracts the negative ones in the, uh, on the balloon. And that's the reason why the balloon sticks to the wall. Hopefully you've seen it as a party trick uh, yourself. And obviously try it yourself. Like, take a balloon, blow it up, rub it against your hair or your jumper, and you'll be able to uh, stick it against the wall based upon this principle. Now a use of static electricity can be the following. Let's say you were to paint a car uh, efficiently. So what you can do is this, you can charge the car positive. Yeah, so you would attach it uh, to a terminal and it becomes positively charged and you charge the paint negative. Then you spray the paint, obviously the positive and negative, they will attract and therefore they will stick or evenly uh, across the car. So this is a great way to use static electricity to paint a car. Electric shocks. So let's say over here we have a, a cloud and it's full of electrons over here. A cloud is full of electrons and you're flying a kite. First of all, hopefully you can identify that uh, the electrons over here will want to like discharge itself. And that's the reason why we get an electric shock. So this spark occurs from there going all the way down. The reason why is because there's a large potential difference from uh, the cloud and yourself. And that's what causes the spark. And in this case, it's the lightning strike. That's why you see the lightning over here, because it's trying to discharge itself because all the charge builds up. And that's the reason why we get an uh, electric shock, because there's a large potential difference, hence why the charge jumps from one place to another. An electric field is going to be the following. It is a region in space in which a charged particle experiences a force. So look over here, we've got two electric fields. This one's a positive one, and look, the arrows are going outwards. Negative one, the arrows are going inwards over here. The direction of the field tells you that if it were to put a positive charge here, it will move along that line. If I were to put a positive charge here, it moves along this line. So the direction of the field lines tells you the direction in which a positively charged particle will move in. This one is a uniform field. The reason why is because the lines are evenly spaced out here. Like school uniform, it's e evenly spaced. You know, everyone's the same. Same idea. One, two, three. All the lines are evenly spaced. This one's a uniform field. The previous one over here, this one is a radial field. The reason why, we can hopefully see that the closer you are to the center, to the, the actual object itself, the stronger the field will be. The reason why is because the density of the field lines indicates the strength of the field. So over here, because there's loads of field lines in a small a bit of area, that's why the field is stronger. But the further away you are, the less strong the field will be. Okay, so now electrical circuits. So we've got to be able to identify the electrical components uh, and the different symbols. So look, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 different electrical symbols, open switch, close switch, lamp, diode, LED, cell, power supply, fixed resistor, variable resistor, fuse, thermistor, LDR, ammeter, and voltmeter over here. So all of these ones over here. Make sure that you are able to draw them and identify them in a circuit. Okay, so electrical current. So current is simply the rate of flow of charge. Current flows from the positive terminal, the long stick, to the small one going all the way around over here. If you want to measure the current of a component going through it, uh, right now, look, you place the ammeter in series with it. The ammeter is placed in series. So the formula for the current is equal to the charge divided by time. I is equal to Q divided by T. I is measured in amps, the charge is in coulombs, the time is in seconds over here. There we go. Right, so this is called conventional current because the current is moving from the positive terminal all the way around to the negative one. Right, so you might be asked about the electron flow in this diagram. So electrons don't move from the positive term to negative. If you were to look at this diagram, you can see that the electrons are going from the negative terminal to the positive one. The reason why? Because the electrons are repelled from the negative terminal. Obviously, the same charges repel and attract it to the positive one over here. So conventional current goes from long stick positive to negative, but the electron flow is actually in the opposite direction. Right, voltage and potential difference between two points. So the voltage is simply the energy per unit charge. Voltage is equal to energy divided by the charge. V is equal to E over Q. That's going to be our formula. The units, voltage measured in volts, energy is in joules, charge in coulombs. If you want to measure the voltage of a component, you place it in parallel around the component over here. So look, it's placed in parallel around the component. There we go. 
Right, now, current in series and parallel circuits. So the rule for current is going to be this. Current in a circuit, it splits at the junction. So that means that the total current going into a junction is equal to the total current out of the junction. So look, there we go, the current comes in, it splits and goes there and there. So therefore, uh, then look at this point over here, these two combine together to make this one over here. So look, you can say that the total current going in is equal to the total current coming out at the junction. So look, this one, IT is equal to I1 plus I2, which is this one over there, and I1 plus I2, as they both recombine, they will make IT over here. Easy stuff. Voltage in series and parallel circuits. The total voltage into a loop is equal to the total voltage out of the loop. So look over here, the sum of the voltage in is equal to the sum of the voltage out in one complete loop. That basically means this. Look, look, we've got one loop there and one loop over here, back to the center. So look, V in is equal to V1 plus V2. Yes, over there. And also we know that the V in is also equal to V3. So this voltage across here is the same voltage across this one over here. Required practical voltage and current characteristics of a fixed resistor. So in order to look at the voltage and current characteristics of a fixed resistor, you need the following circuit. You need a power supply, fixed resistor, variable resistor, the ammeter placed in series, and the voltmeter placed in parallel. Right, the method. So obviously set up as shown. Then obviously turn on the power supply and then record the values of the voltage and the current. Yes, from the voltmeter and the ammeter. And then you change the variable resistance over here, which will affect the current in the circuit. And then you repeat again, recording the voltage and the current again. There we go. Uh, control variables. Keep the fixed resistor the same throughout the entire investigation. Yes. Uh, keep the power supply voltage the same each time. You're only changing this fixed, the variable resistor over here and recording the voltage and the current of the fixed resistor. Then if you were to plot the graph, you'll recognize that you get a straight line relationship between the voltage and the current over here. Uh, risk assessment, obviously, turn off the power supply in between readings to stop the fixed resistor from overheating as well. Right, now once you've done that, uh, you can then look at the voltage and current characteristics of a filament lamp. So look, it's the exact same circuit. I've just swapped the fixed resistor for the filament lamp. You do the same thing again. You do simply just going to change the variable resistance over here and record voltage and current. You end up with the following graph now. So look, it curves off over here. Right, so making sure that you can explain this graph, the reason why you get this S shape is because uh, the lamp starts to heat up the more and more current you pass through it. As the lamp starts to heat up, what happens is the resistance increases. If there's a resistance increase, what happens is the current obviously has to stop increasing. Not decrease, but stop increasing over here. So the reason why the current starts to level off is because the resistance is increasing. Make sure you can recognize that the filament lamp results in this S shape over here. Right, so once you've done that for the filament bulb, you can then do it for the diode. So look, it's the exact same circuit. And what you're going to do is you're going to change the variable resistance and record the voltage and the current over here. Uh, and you'll get the following graph, guys. So there'll be no current in one direction. And look, after a while, then the, the current then starts to increase. So make sure you're happy with this graph as well. So looking at them all together, we can see for the fixed resistor, we get the straight line directly proportional relationship. For the filament bowl, we can see that it curves off over here. For the diode, we can see that it doesn't work in a one direction, then it starts to go up. Make sure you can understand that for the fixed resistor, voltage is proportional uh, to the current, yes. And therefore, you can actually get, say that V is directly proportional to I. And this leads us to Ohm's law, which is going to be the voltage is equal to the current times by the resistance over here. V is equal to I times by R over here. Uh, and look, we talked about the filament bulb. The reason why it levels off is because the resistance increases. I'll put that on the board. And the diode. The diode is quite important because the re it only works if it's a certain way around in your circuit. If you put it the wrong way around in your circuit, the current will not flow through it. So if you over here, you can see that it, there's no current because uh, it has an extremely high resistance in this direction. That's the reason why. So it has extremely high resistance in this direction. And over here, it, there's a threshold voltage before the current can flow. Right, so now combining resistors, if you want to combine two resistors together, let's say you had R1 and R2 over here, you want to draw another circuit, combine them together, you simply add them together. So R1 plus R2 is equal to RT over here. And here's an example, 10 and 20 ohm resistor, add together, it's going to be 30 ohms in total. Right, if you want to combine them in parallel, so look, these two are now connected in parallel. If you want to make them into one simple circuit over here, you can do 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 is 1 over the resistance in total. You're not required to know that formula, but just uh, be familiar with it. Right, so let's look at this example. Let's say I have a 10 ohm resistor and a 20 ohm resistor connected in parallel. Look, in terms of the maths, 1 over 10 plus 1 over 20 is equal to 3 over 20 over here. Yes, cross multiply. Therefore, 20 over 3 
This, the equivalence resistance, these two combined together, make 6.67. Yes, there's less resistance combining them together. All right, and therefore, to summarize, hopefully you can identify that combining resistors in series, look, it will uh, obviously give you more resistance than if you were to combine them in parallel. Yeah, comparing the left-hand side to the right-hand side over here. Right, then, required practical factors affecting the resistance of electrical circuits. Combinations of resistors in series and parallel. Right, so you say take a cell, you have resistor R1 and R2 connected to an ammeter and return back again. You then pl place the voltmeter around both the resistors. Then you were to re record the voltage value and the current value. And to work at the resistance, the total, you simply do the voltage divided by the current over here. Then you do the same thing for a parallel circuit. So you take the cell, then you have R1 and R2. You have the ammeter returning back again. You put the voltmeter around the parallel combination bit. And notice that you record the voltage again and the current again. And you then you work at the resistance by doing V divided by I. And notice, look, the resistance will be 25. So look, obviously there's less resistance uh, when they're in parallel compared to when they're in series. So once again, summary, combining two resistors in a parallel combination will have an effective resistance lower than the two resistors connected in series. Required practical three, factors that affect the resistance of electrical circuits. The length of wire at a constant temperature. So you're going to change the length of the wire and you're going to see what happens to the resistance of the wire. So you need a power supply, an ammeter, a voltmeter, the wire itself, crocodile clips, and the wire should be attached to a meter ruler. Yes, yeah, so a meter ruler over there. So you set up the circuit as shown in a diagram. Change the length of the wire. So you move the crocodile clips, you change the length of the wire. And what happens is you're going to measure the voltage from the voltmeter and the current from the ammeter over here. Uh, and then you're going to calculate the resistance by doing the voltage divided by the current. Obviously, to, uh, and then you're going to put that value into your resistance here. Look at your table of results, you'll change the length, voltage, current, and then resistance over here. And then once you've done this, uh, the resistance, uh, don't forget, uh, you, you can measure the length by because it's stuck on the meter rule. And then the control variables is going to be the thickness of the wire, so you have to keep the thickness of the wire the same. Uh, you keep the surrounding temperature the same as well. The risk assessment, turn off the current in between the readings to stop the wire from heating up. So you turn off the current in between the readings to stop the wire from heating up. And finally, you plot the graph of resistance versus length. Hopefully you recognize that there's the length of the wire increases, the resistance of the wire will increase. Think about it like a road. The longer the length of the road, the more traffic there will be along the road. So, And resistance is the idea of traffic. Okay, so next thing. Fermistor then, what is a fermistor? A fermistor is simply a resistor which depends upon the temperature of its surroundings. Think of the word fermistor, so thermal resistor. And you get the following graph over here. You can see that as you increase the temperature, the resistance drops down. This is called a negative temperature coefficient fermistor. Why? Because it's going down, it's negative temperature coefficient. So as the temperature increases, the resistance decreases. So as the temperature increases, the resistance goes down. Now let's look at it in a circuit. So over here we've got a cell, I've got a bulb, and I've got the fermistor. So look, what happens if the temperature of the surrounding increases? If the temperature of the surrounding increases, the resistance of the circuit will drop down. If the resistance drops down, therefore the current will increase, and therefore the bulb will shine brighter. So make sure you can use a fermistor in a circuit, you know how it will influence the rest of the components. And by symmetry, if the temperature of the surroundings decreases, obviously we know that uh, the resistance will increase and therefore the current drops down, therefore the bulb will get dimmer. So make sure you can use the, that, this graph when you're tackling those questions over here. Next one, the LDR, the light dependent resistor. So light dependent resistor, uh, very simply, it's going to be a resistor which depends upon the light uh, upon it. So look over here, it's a rectangle with two lines going into it. This is a NTC LDR, negative temperature coefficient LDR. You can see as the light intensity increases, the resistance drops down. Yes, so as light intensity increases, the resistance drops down over here. And look at it in this circuit over here. So what happens as the light intensity of the surrounding increases? If I increase the light intensity, what happens is the resistance drops down, therefore there's more current, and therefore the motor will spin faster. Make sure you can see that, yeah? And obviously, um, as the light intensity decreases, yes, the resistance increases, the current decreases then, and therefore, if this motor gets less current, it will spin slower. 
Direct current now. Direct current is simply current flowing in one direction only. This usually happens in batteries and cells over here. So look, the current will go in the same direction all the time. If I was to plot a graph of voltage against time, the line is a straight horizontal line because it's never changing direction. This is going to be direct current. Alternating current is simply going to be this. The current will go one way around the circuit and then it will reverse and then it will reverse again. So it keeps swapping directions. So alternating current, the current changes direction. It goes one way and then it uh, swaps around. So look at our graph of voltage against time right now. We can see the current goes one way, then reverses each time over here. So this is going to be the graph for the AC uh, supply. For an AC supply, the voltage time graph looks like this. All right, plugs right now. So we've got three wires right now. We've got live, earth, and neutral. The live wire is brown and it brings the charge into the device and has a potential difference of 230 volts. The blue wire is a neutral wire and it's going to the left hand side over here and it carries the charge back down uh, to the plug over here. It has a potential difference of zero volts. The striped green and yellow wire, this one over here is the earth wire and this is a safety wire and it has also a potential of zero volts. A nice way to memorize which way the wires are going is because if you take the second word of the color, look, second word of uh, brown is R, sorry, second letter of brown is R and T top. L left, you can see where this one goes to the right, this one goes to the top, this one goes to the left over here. The wires are made of, of copper because they're a good conductor of electricity and each of them are plastically insulated, obviously, so therefore they're not going to touch each other. The fuse, the fuse is a very thin wire which melts if the current is too high and therefore it breaks the circuit. There are different types of fuse ratings, guys, and look, it's found over here, look, the fuse is over there. There are different types of fuse ratings, 3 amps, 5 amps, 9 amps and 13 amps. The fuse rating tells you the current in which the fuse melts. So if you put 3 amps uh, into a 3 amp fuse, it will melt it straight away. So a good idea is going to be the following. Let's say we had a, a kettle which uses 8 amps. Which fuse do I take? I choose the 9 amp fuse, yes? So you choose one just above it over here. For a kettle that takes 12 amps, I would take a 13 amp fuse. Uh, if, I, if the kettle had 5 amps, obviously I can't put the 5 amp fuse in because obviously it would just blow straight away. So I must choose the 9 amp fuse for a 5 amp kettle. How does the earth wire work? Right, so how does the earth wire work? So over here, look, this is a toaster over here. And what happens is we have got a live wire going in and this is the heating element of the toaster. And then you've got the neutral wire going back out again. Right, so this is the toaster working fine. So let's say for uh, by accident, the live wire becomes loose and touches the metal case. What will then happen is obviously the charge will then build up upon the metal case because the case is made out of metal. So that's obviously going to be dangerous because if you touch it, you're going to get a shock because it has a high potential difference and you will have a low one, it will jump onto you. So the following is helpful. They attach an earth wire to the metal case. The reason why is because now the charge can flow. All those electrons can now flow through the earth wire down it back to the plug over here. So that's the function of the earth wire. In case the metal case becomes charged, it now has an alternative route to flow through it back to the plug, keeping you safe. Oscilloscope traces. So over here, this is the best way to visualize signals. So basically, it's like a piece of graph paper, but they haven't told you that the vertical plane is going to be the voltage, the horizontal one is going to be the time over here. Um, each square, it will have its value. So you can change the value of each square in terms of the voltage. So the, it will be either volts per division going vertically or uh, time per division going horizontally over here. Right, so here's a good example of actually using the oscilloscope trace. Let's say we have an AC supply over here and look, it's set to two volts per division. That's why every square is worth two. And each horizontal one is five milliseconds. So every well, the time one is five milliseconds. So if you want to work at the frequency, it's one over the time period. The time period is obviously going to be the time taken for it to go up and down here. So obviously 5, 10, 15, 20 milliseconds is the time period. That's why I put it over there. That's why at 20 milliseconds convert to seconds, 20 times by 10 to minus 3. So I do 1 divided by that, it will be 50 hertz. So yes, 50 hertz will be the AC uh, supply frequency. Okay, and the UK main supply is going to be 50 hertz and the voltage is 230 volts, everyone. So make sure you put this into your mind as well. So every single UK main supply is oscillating at 50 hertz, obviously AC, and the voltage is 230 volts. Right, electrical power now. So if you want to work out the electrical power uh, of a component, it's simply going to be the current times by the voltage. So power is equal to current times by voltage over here. P is equal to I times by V where power is measured in watts, current is measured in amps, voltage is measured in volts over here. And look, we can see that also, if you know that Ohm's law, V is equal to IR, I can replace the V with IR, it becomes P is equal to 
i squared r, yes, because v is i r over there. Or if I rearrange this and say i is v over r, I can then replace the i over there. Power is also equal to v squared over r. So you've got three versions of this formula. Power is equal to i times by v, power is equal to i squared r, and power is equal to v squared over r. Voltmeters and ammeters. So a bit of basic stuff with regards to voltmeters and ammeters. The ammeter has minimal resistance to allow the maximum current to pass through it over here, and the voltmeters over here have maximum resistance, so therefore it can it has to stop the current from going down this branch, it has to force the current to go through there. If this one had a low resistance, the current would simply bypass the component going around. Right, so now transformers. Why do we need transformers? So first of all, uh, we know that electricity is made at power stations and it must be transported to our homes. If the current is too high, what happens is if you pass high current through a wire, the wire heats up, it's very inefficient because energy is lost as heat. So therefore you install uh, transformers. You either put a step up transformer and a step down transformer in between the power station and the home. So look what the step up transformer is going to do. It takes the high current and it makes it a low current. It does this by stepping up the voltage. So look, it takes the low voltage and it makes it higher. It steps up the voltage to reduce the current. And the step down transformer, it will reduce the voltage there we go, to increase the current back up again, over here. So make sure you're happy with step up and step down transformers. And look at my summary statements over here. The step up transformer increases the voltage to reduce the current. And look, if you look at the power formula, the voltage goes up, the current goes down for the power to remain the same. And the step down transformer is going to decrease the voltage to increase the current back up again, over here, for the power to remain the same. The National Grid is simply a system of pylons, cables and transformers used to help distribute electricity across the UK. It also responds to the changes in the supply and demand of electricity in the UK. So look, you've got power station, step up transformer, a pylon, then look, then you obviously the wire, the cable is going all the way from one pylon to the next, then a step down transformer back to your home over here. So obviously the pylons are there to help uh, hold the cables in place. And don't forget the function of the transformers is, is because you want it to be low current uh, when it's being uh, distributed, so therefore there's the least energy loss. Density. Density is equal to the mass of an object divided by the volume. Here is our formula, rho is equal to m divided by v. The units for them, as you can see, are going to be green. If the mass is in kilograms and the volume is in meters cubed, therefore your density will be measured in kilogram per meter cubed. But sometimes you might find that the, you can use the mass in grams and the volume in centimeter cubed and therefore uh, the density will be in grams per centimeter cubed. So you can use kilogram over meter cubed or gram per centimeter cubed depending upon the quantities that you've got. Required practical, the density of a regular object and the density of an irregular object and the density of a liquid. Right, so in order to work out the density of a regular object, so let's say we gave you this object over here, all you've got to do is the following. So first of all, you know that the formula is going to be mass divided by volume. So to measure the mass, you place it on a scale, you record that it's value of the mass. To measure the volume, you do the length times by the base times by the height, measured with a ruler. And then you simply chuck it into the equation, density is equal to mass divided by the volume, and therefore you've worked out the density of a regular object. Control variables, you keep the block the same throughout the experiment. Density of an irregular object. So let's say you have an object over here and the shape is not uniform, it's all over the place, let's say like a set of keys. In order to work out the density of this, you can use a displacement can method. So here's my displacement can. It's basically a can which has a little spout right at the edge, yeah, right at the brim over here. Right, so what you're going to do is you're going to take the irregular object, you're going to drop it into the displacement can. So you fill it with water, drop the object into the displacement can, and what will happen is water will come out. Yes, yeah? so look, when you drop the object in, the water will come out of the spout over here, and you can collect the water over here. The volume of the fluid displaced, so whatever volume of the water that you have here, that is the same as the volume of the actual object. Okay, so now you've got the volume of it. In order to work out the mass, you just simply place it on a set of scales. So therefore you've got the mass, yes, by placing it on a set of scales. You've now got the volume, simply measure this volume over here. Therefore you then use the formula density is mass over volume, and then you've got your density of an irregular object. Density of a liquid, right, so density of a liquid. So you need a measuring cylinder, first of all, and you simply place it on a scale and you measure its mass, okay? Then you fill it up with a liquid, okay? Then you place that on a scale and you measure its mass now. So you've got the mass of it empty, you've got the mass of it containing the water or the liquid, whatever liquid it is. In order to work out the mass of the liquid itself, you simply subtract them. 
So this, the mass of this, subtract the mass of this, will tell you the mass of the liquid itself. There we go. In order to work out the volume, simply read it off because it's a measuring cylinder, and then you've got the volume, and then finally from there, you simply use the formula density is equal to mass divided by the volume to work out the density of the liquid. States of matter, so there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. First of all, look, and we've drawn them out over here. This may be a question, make sure you can draw them out. First of all, in a solid, the particles vibrate in fixed positions. They're in a regular arrangement, fixed pattern. There are strong forces of attraction between the particles. It's incompressible and it's a fixed volume. Liquid, the particles can slip past each other. There's irregular arrangements, yes, yeah, so there's not, you can't, it's not in a pattern itself. There's moderate forces of attraction between the particles. It's incompressible, you can't squash the liquid down, and it takes the volume of the container. So let's say you put water into a teapot, it becomes the shape of the teapot. Uh, gas, particles are free to move. The particles have high kinetic energy. There are minimal forces of attraction between the particles, and they take the volume of the container. So if I spray a gas in here, obviously it fills up the entire room. It takes the volume of the container over here. Then from here, we're gonna talk about changes of state. So over here, we've got this diagram. We can see that we've got solid, liquid, and gas. Right, and to go from solid to liquid, that process is called melting. Uh, liquid to gas, obviously we're heating up even more, so the red lines indicate heat, it's going to be evaporating, and then uh, blue lines mean you're going to be cooling it down. So gas to liquid is called condensing, liquid to solid is going to be freezing over here. Then there's a direct route from solid to gas, sometimes you can skip out the liquid phase, it's called the sublimation, and going from gas to solid, it's called deposition. When you're changing state, guys, the mass is conserved. So if I gave you 100 grams of ice, that would obviously end up being 100 grams of water, yes? Which would then be 100 grams of steam. The mass is conserved each time. Okay, now from here, we're gonna plot a graph of temperature versus time. Let's say I gave you a piece of ice over here and we started to heat it up. We will notice that uh, the temperature increases at the start, then it's going to go straight, then it increases again, then it goes straight, then it goes up one more time. Right, so first of all, the diagonal bits are going to be when it's in a solid, uh, then the next state will be liquid, and the gas one over here. It goes uh, right now, you can see there's a horizontal line over here, and there's a horizontal line over here. The reason why is because there is no change in temperature at this point here. There is no change in temperature over here. The reason why is because the energy you are supplying, yes, to the solid, is being used to break the bonds. So we're going to break the bonds here, I'm going to break the bonds here. There we go. Uh, so there we go, horizontal lines, changing state, there's no heating. Diagonal line, the object is heating up, but there's no change in state. Okay, so you're changing states on the horizontal bits. Internal energy. The internal energy of a system is the sum of the potential and kinetic energy of the particles. The internal energy is equal to the sum of the kinetic energy of all the particles inside, plus the sum of the potential energy as well. Increasing the temperature of a system increases the kinetic energy of the system. Therefore, the internal energy of the system increases. That simply means if you heat up, uh, let's say, like a cup of water, the particles gain kinetic energy, and therefore the internal energy has been increased. And then from here, guys, at the bottom, we've got solid, liquid, and gas. If you were to go from solid to liquid, the potential energy increases. From uh, liquid to gas, the potential energy increases again. From gas to liquid, the potential energy decreases. And from liquid to solid, the potential energy decreases. So make sure you're happy with the, how the potential energy varies as well. The specific heat capacity, right, specific heat capacity is going to be the energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. The greater the specific heat capacity of a material, the more energy is required to change its temperature. And look, energy is equal to mass times by the specific heat capacity times by the temperature change. E is equal to mc delta theta, where energy is measured in joules, mass in kilograms. The specific heat capacity is joules per kilogram degree Celsius. The temperature change delta theta will be in degree Celsius. And look, here's an example over here. We can see that water has a specific heat capacity of 4,200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And the specific heat capacity of oil is 2,000 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So we can clearly see that it would take you more energy to heat up the water than the oil. Yes, you should, hopefully you'll be, you should be aware of that with regards to cooking. Yes, it will take you more energy to heat up a pan of water compared to a pan of oil. And look on this side over here, we've got a question in which we can use our formula E is equal to mc delta theta. Uh, a bowl of mass of 100 grams is heated from 5 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius. Given that specific heat capacity of the water is 4,200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius, calculate the energy. E is equal to mc delta theta, the energy, uh, we're going to calculate that. The mass, 100 grams, convert to uh, kilograms, because our form is in kilograms. 0 0.1, 4 
4,200 uh, is going to be our specific heat capacity. The temperature change is 45 minus 5, and therefore plugging it all in, you get the value of the energy is equal to 16800 uh, joules. Specific latent heat now. So the specific latent heat is, first of all, it's different to the specific heat capacity. The specific latent heat of a substance is the energy required to change the state of one kilogram of substance with no increase in temperature. So this is what you're going to use when you're talking about it changing state. You're not heating up anymore, you're just changing its state. There's a formula, it's going to be the energy is equal to the mass times by the specific latent heat. E is equal to ML. Energy is measured in joules, the mass is in kilograms, the specific latent heat of the material is joules per kilogram. And look over here, there are now two types. So obviously, um, whenever you're uh, doing these calculations, recognize that one is the specific latent heat of fusion, and one is the specific latent heat of vaporization. So this is the same formula, we've got just slightly different, I'll put a subscript over here. So E is equal to ML fusion, and this one E is equal to ML vaporization. Fusion, whenever I use that, I've got to be talking about solid to liquid or liquid to solid. So for any process going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, I'm going to use a specific latent heat of fusion. For vaporization, it's the change of state from liquid to gas or gas to liquid, I've got to use this formula now. And then the formal definitions at the bottom for them separately. The specific uh, latent heat of fusion is the energy required to change the state of one kilogram of a substance from solid to liquid with no increase in temperature. And the specific latent heat of vaporization is the energy required to change the state of one kilogram of substance from liquid to gas with no increase in temperature. Then from here, guys, we're moving on to this. So here's a couple of examples of it. So look, we can see that water has a specific latent heat of fusion of uh, 334000 joules per kilogram, and its latent heat of vaporization is 2,260,000 uh, over here. Yes, so we, clearly we can see that the latent heat of fusion is not the same as the latent heat of vaporization. So on my graph, we can see that uh, this bit over here, this horizontal bit over here, corresponds to the specific latent heat of fusion. So that's why the line is like this. The line is longer for this one over here. Why? Because it's vaporization and you require more energy. So look for the water one, that's why it's 334000 joules over here. And look, this requires more energy, hence why the horizontal line is longer. Make sure that you can actually um, identify them on your temperature and time graph. Multiple thermal changes. So this one was quite tricky, guys. So this is uh, probably the top end of the course. This is, let's say we have this, uh, we know that it goes from solid, then change state, then liquid, then change state, then to gas. They might ask you a tricky question in which you're trying to uh, work out the total energy for this whole process. Or well, recognize you need some energy for this bit, some energy for this, some energy for this, some energy for this, and some energy for this over here. The total energy to go from ice, let's just say we had ice, we're going to go to steam, you need to add all the energies together. So you need some energy there, 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 and there. So this bit will be the specific heat capacity of the ice, because you're heating it up. And then this bit will be the specific latent heat of the fusion of water. Then this will be the specific heat capacity of the water. Yes, because you're heating it up. Then again, then this one will be the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. Yes, over here. And last of all, the specific heat capacity of the steam, this bit over here. So therefore, one, two, three, four, five processes over here. And that's why I look at my formula that's coming from there. And it's the second one there. MC delta theta there. ML vaporization over there, MC delta theta for the last one over here. So this is when you have to add all the energies up for the entire uh, process, going from all the way over here to all the way over there. This is a tricky topic, so if you're still struggling, look at my playlist down below. I've got a whole exam walkthrough just on these questions here. Brownian motion now. So over here we have the following. We have, um, let's say, a Petri dish full of water. I've got some pollen grains in there. So when you look at them under a microscope, the pollen grains are seen to be moving around, yes? Okay, jiggling about. The reason why is because the pollen grains are being hit by the water particles from all directions, yes, at different speeds and at random motion, yes? So in different speeds and random directions, that's how the water particles are moving. And that is known as Brownian motion. It tells us that the particles are moving in a random motion and at various speeds, and that's how gases behave. Gas pressure. So first of all, gases actually have pressure. Uh, if you've forgotten, pressure is equal to force divided by area. So uh, particles, let's say we have a box over here, the particles are moving around. 
every time they collide with the wall of the container, they collide with the wall of the container, they exert a force. Yes, every time they collide. So now we've got collisions, force acting over a unit area, hence why is a pressure. So gases have a pressure due to this reason. It's because of the collisions of the particles against the walls of the container. Gas pressure and temperature, right. So what happens if we were to increase the temperature of a gas? So let's say we have a gas over here and we are going to heat it up, right? We're gonna heat up, hopefully we identify that the particles are going to gain kinetic energy and move faster. If they move faster, they travel faster across and they collide more often with the walls of the container. So when there are more collisions per second, obviously there's going to be more force acting per second as well. Therefore, we know the pressure will be higher. So if, as you increase the temperature of a gas, the pressure increases. Pressure in fluid. Let's say you were asked to work at the pressure in a fluid. So let's say we have a, let's say a swimming pool over here. We can see that the pressure inside the fluid can be calculated by the density of the fluid times by the gravitational field strength of the planet that you're on times by the height of the fluid, yeah, or height of the column, yeah, how far from the surface that you are. Uh, P, with the pressure, is equal to rho g h. P is pressure measured in Pascal, P A. The density is going to be kilogram per meter cubed. Gravitational field strength is newtons per kilogram, and the height will be meters over there. There we go. And look on the right hand side, I've got another example of this. You can pause the video to look at that. Uh, just a simple question, uh, practicing the use of that equation. Gas pressure and volume now. So gas pressure and volume. So over here, we've got the following. We've got uh, a gas in a container. And let's say we were to, uh, right now, there's, uh, we were to squash it down. What would happen to the pressure? Well, if you reduce the volume, what happens is, obviously, we reduce the volume, there's less space for the particles to travel. So therefore, there are more collisions per second. And therefore, the pressure will increase. So by reducing the volume, the pressure will increase over here. We end up with the following relationship. If you plot the graph of pressure versus volume, it's going down, inversely proportional. Pressure is proportional to one over the volume. P is proportional to one over V. And therefore, the pressure will be equal to, moving from here to there, you just put a constant mathematically, a constant divided by V. Therefore, moving this up, pressure times by the volume will be equal to a constant. Okay, so along that line, the constant remains the same. If you take any value of the pressure and the volume, uh, at, along this line over here, they will have the same constant. Then this leads us to the following. So let's look, look at the following graph. We've got pressure versus volume. I've got a volume V1 over here, the volume here, V1 and P1. And over here, I've got the final volume V2 and the pressure P2. We know that P1 times by V1 is a constant, yes, for these two. But we also know that P2 times by V2 will also be a constant. Because the constant is the same for both of them, I can equate them both. So P1 times by V1 is equal to P2 times by V2, leading us to this expression over here. Then, work done on the gas. Okay, let's say we have a container full of particles over here, and let's say that one of the walls of the container are compressed rapidly. So you rapidly squash it down over here. What's gonna happen is as you move this wall closer, very rapidly, the particles will hit the wall and don't forget, if you move this and the particles are hitting the wall at the same time, they will gain kinetic energy. So therefore, the pressure will increase. There we go. So uh, this is when the work is done on a gas over here. Because you've exerted a force on the particles as you've squashed down uh, the wall over here. So the particles now gain kinetic energy because you've squashed it down. And therefore, this increases the internal energy of the system. Work is being done on the gas because you are squashing it down. That's the reason why work is done on the gas, and work done is energy transferred via forces. Atmospheric pressure now. So let's say on the top left-hand side, this is the Earth's surface, we can usually talk about the air being uniform, of a uniform density over here. But in reality, the Earth's surface is not like that. The Earth's surface is more like this. There's a greater density at the bottom, and there's less at the top. Okay? Hopefully you know the reason why. It's because gravity is acting, and it drags all the particles down over here. Plotting the graph of pressure versus altitude, we can see the following, that as you get further and further away from the Earth's surface, the pressure will decrease. And once again, we can use our formula for pressure uh, for the fluid. Don't forget, this is a fluid, so we can use pressure is equal to the density of the fluid times by gravity times by the height, the same formula we looked at earlier on. Right, atomic structure. So over here, we have an atom. We can see we've got protons and neutrons inside the nucleus over here. Electrons are orbiting over here. Here are my symbols, so proton, there we go, is a charge of plus one. Think of P for proton, meaning positive, the relative mass of one as well. Neutron has a charge of zero, it's neutrally charged. Think of newt, neutral, over here. 
relative mass of 1. The electron over here is orbiting the nucleus. It has a charge of minus 1 over here. Its relative mass compared to the other ones is going to be 1 over 2,000 for this one over here. Right, now, nuclear notation. So sometimes you will see chemical uh, elements over here, and they're represented within this fashion over here. There's a number at the top, a number at the bottom. The top number corresponds to the number of protons and neutrons. The bottom number corresponds to the number of protons, yes? This was going to be the atomic number at the bottom and the mass number at the top, and the chemical symbol goes over here where they exit. So look, this is helium, 4, 2 He. The reason why it's 4 is because there's two protons and two neutrons. In total, there's four but there are two protons. That's the reason why the bottom number is two over there. And yes, the proton number is usually the number of electrons as well. So there we go. So two protons and therefore there are two electrons as well. The radius of an atom is going to be one times by 10 to the minus 10. And the radius of a nucleus is roughly one over 10,000th of the radius of this atom over here. So just make sure you recognize that the nucleus is tiny compared to the actual radius of the entire atom itself. Isotopes. Isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. So over here you've got one, two, three different isotopes of helium. This one is helium-4-2, this one is 5-2, this one is 6-2. As you can see that they have the same number of protons. Red is protons. Yes, yeah, so two protons, two protons, two protons, but the number of neutrons are changing. Hence why it's going to go from 4 to 5 to 6. Because this one, there are two neutrons here, so therefore there's four nucleons in total. This one is five in total in the nucleus. This one is six in nucleus, hence why it's over here. So isotopes have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. History of the atom. You've got to be aware of how the model of the atom has changed as time has gone on and how we've discovered new things about the atom. So first of all, there was a model that uh, basically atoms were tiny, spherical, indivisible over here. And then we moved on to the plum pudding model. It was just going to be a giant positive charge, a solid block and negatively charged electrons embedded around it. Very similar to a pudding, yes, that's the whole point. It's a plum pudding model. Some kids don't like that. You can think about it as a chocolate chip cookie and the electrons are like the chips which are embedded within the cookie. It's the same idea. But it's a giant positive charge and there are negatively charged electrons uh, embedded. There is no free space in this and the electrons are not free to move. And then from here we move on to the Rutherford's model over here, which is the nuclear model. He found out that the, in the center there's a positive charge over here in the nucleus. This is called the nucleus, and it's positively charged, and the electrons are orbiting it over here. Electrons are orbiting it over here. Make sure you can identify that there are no neutrons right now, the reason why they haven't been discovered yet. But there's a big flaw in this, so obviously if this is positive, this is negative, hopefully that you can see that they would collapse because they would be attracted towards each other. So that led us to the Bohr's model of the atom, in which he stated that there were protons and neutrons inside the nucleus, the neutrons were discovered by James Chadwick, and the electrons are orbiting in fixed shells. So now they are electrons in fixed shells, not just whizzing around it in an orbit over here. And the electrons, because they are in fixed shells, they cannot drop down. Right, how on earth did we get to Rutherford's model? It's going to be via the Rutherford Alpha Scattering Experiment. So what he did was this. He took a radioactive source, which was going to emit alpha particles. For now, just accept that these are some particle, radioactive particles which are positively charged. So positively charged particles are coming out of this source over here. There's a lead-lined container around it to just block off any alpha particles which might go back. Uh, and then the alpha particles are going to travel across. He fired them at a thin layer of gold foil over here. And he put a Geiger counter on the opposite side over here. The Geiger counter detects the alpha particles. Every click uh, the Geiger counter receives tells you that an alpha particle has been detected. And look, I've got a counter over there. So obviously if loads of them can pass through, this number goes up. Here are his results, guys. So look, you can see that most of the alpha particles pass straight through. Some of them were deflected, okay? And then very few of them were deflected at extreme angles. Very, very few of them are deflected at extreme angles. What did that mean? Right, so look, this diagram is what I usually use to explain it. So look, I've got the alpha particles going over here, and look, they're all going across. We can, and this is the atom, the, the atom that obviously he was proposing. This kind of makes sense now, because you know that most of the atom is empty space, hence why most of the alpha particles can pass straight through. So look, this one passes through, this one passes through, this one passes through, and these ones at the bottom over here. Then, as some of the alpha particles get closer to the nucleus, Hopefully you recognize that the alpha particle is positively charged. The nucleus must be positively charged because it's going to deflect them away because like charges repel. And that's the reason why it deflected away over here. And then some of them were deflected by extreme angles over here. So what does that mean? It means that it's 
the, the nucleus is a tiny concentrated mass within the atom itself. That's why it's very hard to fire at it directly and hit it head on. So look over here, we've got the following our observations. Most of the alpha particle passes straight through because most of the atom is empty space. Some of the positively charged alpha particles were deflected. The, the reason why is because they are repelled away from the positively charged nucleus. And last of all, very few alpha particles were deflected by extreme angles, almost 180 degrees. The reason why is because the positively charged nucleus is a concentrated mass over here. Make sure you know the difference between these two, the last two. That's most kids get them confused, make sure you know the difference. Electron transitions and radiation. So let's say we have the atom over here. First of all, an electron can move to a higher energy level, so it can go from this one over here to upwards over there, if it absorbs an electromagnetic wave. So look, I've drawn it over here. So look, we have this one over here, we have this electron over here. So look, an electromagnetic wave can come in. This electron can absorb this energy of this electromagnetic wave and move upwards to a higher energy level. So there we go, the electron is promoted to a higher energy level. And by reverse, let's say you had an electron at the top right now, but it wants to go back down. Obviously, it drops back down to this lower energy level, releasing a corresponding uh, electromagnetic wave. Radioactivity. Right, so first of all, let's say we have a nucleus of an atom over here. First of all, the nucleus is stable. Nothing will happen. Yeah, nothing will happen here. It's just stable. Yes, like most of the stuff around us. But if the nucleus becomes unstable, usually when it's too heavy, what happens is it will break down. Yes, and this is known as radioactive decay. So when the nucleus breaks down, this is known as radioactive decay. In a decay process, what can happen is the large unstable nucleus can break down and it can become into two smaller pieces and sometimes you might get alpha radiation coming out, beta radiation coming out, gamma radiation coming out, or neutrons. Sometimes only one of them, but I've drawn all of them over here. And energy is released in this whole process. So when a decay process happens, we get all of these things possibly coming out. Right, so how would you detect alpha, beta, and gamma? So let's say we, obviously, a decay process occurred. How would you detect alpha, beta, and gamma? First of all, you can use the Geiger counter. So look, you can put your radioactive source over here in a lead line container. Yes, the reason why we'll come across that in a minute. And what happens is the alpha particles travel outwards and the Geiger counter will click every time an alpha source is detected. Yes, or beta source or gamma source over here. The activity is basically the amount of radioactive uh, particles detected per second. There we go, the amount of ionizing radiation detected per second. The units of activity are called the becquerel, capital B lowercase q, the becquerel over there, or counts per second or counts per minute. Right, background radiation. Background radiation is the radiation that naturally surrounds us from our environment. It is dependent upon many factors including jobs and location. These are the naturally sourced ones over here. Radon gas uh, from rocks and buildings, cosmic rays from space, radioactive material in food and drink. Uh, Man-made ones, so obviously if you do these jobs or you're around these areas, you'll get exposed to more radiation. X-ray equipment, imaging, nuclear fallout from nuclear weapons, so if there's a nuclear disaster in the area, nuclear accidents such as Chernobyl or Fukushima. Obviously if you live near a nuclear power plant which will obviously collapsed, you'd have more radiation. The radiation dose is measured in sieverts, capital S, lowercase v. Investigating radioactive sources, so let's say you were asked to actually measure um, the radioactivity of a source. First of all, you should measure the background radiation in the room. So you have the Geiger counter, you measure the background radiation in the room, which is going to be my green arrow. Okay, so let's say right now I measured it for one minute, I've got 10. Yes, 10 clicks in one minute. Then if I was to put a source in front of me, I would measure the count rate again. So let's say it's 180 over there. So obviously, the reason why it's higher is because now you have the source plus the background radiation. Therefore, to work out the activity of the source itself, you simply take this value and subtract the initial value over here. So the count rate of the source is equal to the count rate of the source plus the background radiation, which is this one, subtracting the count rate of the background radiation over here, subtracting this one over here. So it's going to be 170 is actually coming from the source because you've excluded the radiation from the background radiation. Properties of alpha, beta, and gamma. So this table you should hopefully memorize that we've got alpha, beta, and gamma over here, and I've got the symbols of them, alpha, four, two, description of alpha particles, two protons and two neutrons, like a helium nucleus. The charge is plus two, why? It has two protons. Relative mass is four, because there are two protons and two neutrons. Each one of them is worth one. It is stopped by 10 centimeters of air, okay? And it's the least penetrative but it is the most ionizing. I'm gonna come across these two bits later on, so don't worry. Beta, uh, symbol of zero minus one, beta over here. It's a fast moving single electron, the charge is minus one. The relative mass is one over 2000 because it's just an electron over here. 
it is stopped by thin metal sheets. Yes, it can pass through paper, but it is stopped by thin metal sheets. The penetrative ability is moderate, ionization ability is moderate as well. Then, gamma over here, zero, zero. Yes, because it's a wave, it's an electromagnetic wave. There we go, the charge is zero. The mass, zero, as it's a wave, stopped by thick lead or concrete. Penetrative ability is the most, it can pass through the most. Ionization ability, it is the least. And here's a nice visualization of the penetrative ability. So look, alpha, stopped by paper. Beta, passed through the paper, stopped by thin metal sheets. Gamma, passed through the paper, passed through the thin metal sheets, but stopped by the thick lead or concrete. So as you go down the group, the penetrative ability is increasing. Nuclear decay equations, right. So when a, a nucleus undergoes a decay, alpha, beta, or gamma, the nucleus will change itself. So we can look at uh, how the atomic mass and the atomic number changes. So over here, look, we've got 235 uranium 92. So first of all, if it undergoes alpha decay, the alpha decay leaves, taking a 4-2 away with it. What happens to the nucleus that's left over? Obviously, I must subtract 4 from the top number and 2 from the bottom one. But look, they balance out. 235 uranium goes to make 231 thorium plus the 4 over here. So these two numbers add together to make this number over here. 92, obviously, it becomes 90 because the 2 is taken over there. For beta minus decay, look carefully, the beta is 0 minus 1. So look, the mass number remains the same. 235 goes to 235 because zero is over here. These two add up to 235. But careful with this one. Uh, we notice that it is 93 because it must be 93 minus the one makes me 92 over here. So in beta decay, one of the neutrons inside the nucleus is converted into a proton. Hence why the proton number goes up over here and the beta particle is emitted. There we go. Right, now, gamma decay. As you can see, gamma, zero, zero, therefore the mass number remains the same, and the atomic number remains the same as well because it makes no change over there. So 235 goes to 235 plus zero. 92 goes to make 92 plus the zero over here. This bit's a bit extra, but beta positive decay. So yes, beta particles can be, they can be a positive version of it. Uh, as you can see, in beta positive decay, one proton in the nucleus is converted into a neutron. So we're going from one proton in the nucleus is being lost and being converted into a neutron. That's why, look, 92 goes to 91, because we've lost a proton, but the mass number remains the same. And the beta positive particle takes away with it the zero and one over here. Ionization ability, right, so I usually use this to explain ionization ability. We can see that we've got um, alpha, beta, and gamma, and let's say we fire them through a group of atoms over here. First of all, to ionize something is to rip off an electron from an atom. So we can see that as the alpha particle moves through it, because it has a charge of plus two, it can knock out the most electrons. So that's why it's highly ionizing, but it travels the least distance. Beta particle, it's only a charge of minus one, so it can knock out a bit more than the alpha. And gamma is the least ionizing, so therefore it interacts with the least amount of electrons over here. So we hopefully can identify that alpha, beta, and gamma as you go up. So alpha is the most ionizing, beta is the moderate one, and gamma is the least ionizing. Half-life. The half-life of a radioactive sample is simply the time taken for the number of nuclei within a radioactive sample to decrease to half of its initial amount. Right, so let's say we gave you uh, all these nuclei over here, red, they're undecayed, but as time goes on, they're going to decay. So look, they eventually they all turn blue over here. So obviously as time goes on, they all decay. If I was to plot the graph of number of undecayed nuclei, so look, we've got loads at the start, okay, and as time goes on, they will decay. So as you can see, guys, as time goes on, the number of nuclei decreases over here. It's an exponential curve downwards. Right, so now from here we can actually uh, look at the half-life on this graph. So look, the half-life to work it out, so first of all, the, the initial amount is 1,000. You look simply look at uh, where 500 is and read off the graph over here. So the time taken for the nuclei to drop down to half of its initial amount is obviously from 1,000 to 500. It's only going to be 10, 10 seconds for this radioactive sample over here. Make sure you draw that on the graph over there. Right, so now from here we're going to look at the uses of nuclear radiation. So over here, this is the physics behind a smoke alarm, and it actually uses nuclear radiation. So here we've got a cell, and we've got a terminal over here, and they place an alpha source on one side. Right, so the alpha source over here, what's going to happen is obviously it will emit alpha particles, they will travel across the gap over here. So now look, you've got a flow of charge, because the alpha particles are charged, they can cross the gap, there will therefore be a current as it goes around the circuit. But then when there's a fire, what happens is obviously smoke particles enter the chamber, right? So now look, the alpha particles are blocked from going across, and therefore the, the circuit um, identifies that there's a drop in the current, and hence the alarm sounds. And this is the reason why we actually use alpha radiation inside a smoke alarm.
Right, using beta decay to measure the thickness of foil. So how they actually keep the foil that's in your kitchen like that thin is going to be via this method. Right, so over here you've got some giant bit of metal coming in, all right, now so a slodge. And what happens is there's two rollers here. The rollers are designed to squash all that metal into a nice thin strip over here. So there we go, it enters on one side and it uses the rollers to squash them over here. So what they do is they actually they put a beta source on one side of the what's coming out. So this is the very thin strip coming out and the Geiger counter are underneath it on the opposite side over here. So the beta source is going to emit the radiation. It's going to travel down and through it and we will get the Geiger counter getting a reading because some of it can pass through. Right, so simply by looking at the Geiger counter, you can determine the thickness of the foil. So over here, we can see that the thickness of the foil has gone up from 100 to 200 over here. So what does that tell you? So obviously that means that if there's loads more radiation being detected, that tells you that the foil is too thin, okay? And therefore, you can separate the rollers to increase the thickness of the foil. And what about this one over here? Let's say that the count rate drops down too much. Obviously, if the count rate drops down too much, that means it must be too thick in the middle. That's why le less beta particles can pass through. And therefore, if it's too thick, you can move the rollers closer together to squash it to make it thinner. Medical traces. So let's say, unfortunately, someone has a tumour over here in an unknown location within the body. So first of all, we can use a radioisotope medical tracer to pinpoint its location. So the person ingests a radioisotope. It goes inside the body. The radioisotope then is expelled. It's going to travel out of the body over here. There we go. But because you have a tumour, the tumour will absorb an excessive amount of the radiation. Okay, so the tumour absorbs a large amount. So let's say then after a period of time you were to come back to the patient and you look at the radiation that it uh, should be given off, you would find that most of the radiation would have disappeared, but because the person has a tumour which absorbed a large amount, it would still be given off the radiation. And hence that's how you can find out the location of a tumour using a medical tracer. Right, so now from here when choosing a radioactive isotope tracer, you obviously must look at the dangers and the half-life of the sample. First of all, the reason why gamma is chosen because you know it can pass through the skin and it can pass outside of the body. Yes, it can pass outside of the body over there. It is also the least ionizing. So you don't want to put alpha inside the body. And then, uh, first of all, the half-life. You do not want it to have a very long half-life because the person will be exposed to a large amount of radiation. Nor do you want the half-life to be too short that you can't actually carry out the experiment. You don't want it to put it in the body and therefore it quickly leaves it over here. So you don't want a too long half-life, not a too short half-life over here. So make sure you are aware of that when choosing the radioactive medical tracer. Next one, the gamma knife. So the gamma knife is this, let's say you have a tumour, let's say in a location in your head. First of all, you just put uh, radioactive cobalt sources at different angles over there around you. And obviously they fire out uh, the radiation and hopefully where all the beams cross over here, it targets the target area and destroys the cells over there, destroys the cells over there. So yes, alpha, beta and gamma are all ionizing. And yes, they can lead to changes in your DNA and therefore mutations and lead to cancer. But it is, as you can see, it can be used to treat cancer as well. Right, so the half-life and half-life calculations. Right, so first of all, radioactive dating. So this is how we actually work out how long something has been dead for. It's via the process of radioactive dating. This is a person over here, and first of all, every single person alive is constantly taking in carbon-14 from the food that you eat. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope, and it decays as time goes on. It has a half-life of 5,700 years, okay? So it has a half-life of 5,700 years. Okay, so right now let's start with the following. Let's say we have a thousand grams of carbon-14 taken into the body right now. Okay, let's say this person over here has a thousand grams. But let's say if the person dies, what will actually happen is obviously there's, you're not taking any more carbon-14, it will decay. So the amount of carbon-14 inside your body will decay as time goes on. So as you can see, the amount of carbon-14 has decreased over here. And that process to go from 1,000 to 500 is one half-life, because that is the definition of the half-life. So that would take me 5,700 years. So here's a good example of radioactive dating. So look, a fit person should have 1,000 grams of carbon-14 inside them. A body is found with 125 grams of carbon-14. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years. For how long has the body been decomposing? The way you tackle this question is the following. So we've got 1,000 grams over here when you're alive, but the body that you found has only got 125. First of all, you know you should have 1,000, but you've got 125. Work out how many half-lives have passed. So look, it's going to from first half-life, second half-life, third half-life over there. So three half-lives have passed to go from 1,000 to 125. And then from there, you know each half-life is worth 5,700 years. Therefore, it's just going to be three times that. There we go. So 17,100 years. 
Uh, if you're still struggling on this, I've got loads of videos on me going through difficult Half-Life questions in the description below. Right, now, nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is the process in which a large stable nucleus splits into small, lighter nuclei releasing energy. The energy comes from the mass difference between the initial nucleus and the products afterwards. So the mass of this nucleus is not equal to the mass of this one plus this one. Why? Some of the mass has been converted into energy. So induced nuclear fission. So this is what occurs inside a nuclear reactor. Basically, they have uranium, yes, which is stable, or, yeah, over here. What they do is they fire a neutron into it, and then, look, you know the neutron goes in, it becomes unstable, and then it starts to split. There we go. It actually splits off into two daughter nuclei, because they come from the parent, that's why it's called daughter nuclei, and three neutrons are released, plus energy. Okay, and look, over here, you can see that one neutron goes into uranium, it becomes uranium-236, Krypton barium are released and free neutrons plus energy is released in this process. Right, so there's something interesting that happens to these free neutrons which are released. Those free neutrons released from the initial fission reaction, yes, this is called induced fission because you are triggering it with the neutron, that's why it's called induced fission. The neutrons released will then hit other uranium nuclei and they will then split themselves. So from one initial neutron we're getting this split, these splits and these splits occurring over here. And therefore, each time this occurs, energy is released in the whole process. Right, so now, how would you control this? This can actually spiral out of control with too much energy being released in a short amount of time. So the simplest way is to absorb the excess neutrons. So you can actually put like blocks inside, you know, these are called control rods, and they are placed inside to absorb the excess neutrons. They are made out of boron. So the excess neutrons uh, are absorbed by the boron here. Now let's look at all of this within a nuclear reactor. So hopefully you remember that a nuclear reactor core is going to produce energy in the form of heat. It then heats up the water, which turns into steam. The steam then goes through the turbine, the turbines turn, which connects to the generator, which creates electricity. So what does a nuclear reactor core look like? It looks like this. There are things which are called fuel rods, which are separated. Yes, they're not touching each other, they're separated. In between each of these fuel rods, there is a control rod, okay? The fuel rods contain the uranium, or whatever fuel that you're using, could be plutonium over here, and the control rods are over here. The control rods can be raised or lowered. The whole thing is uh, has been encased in uh, concrete, yes? The reason why it stops all the excess radiation being uh, emitted to the surroundings over here. Right, and look, all of it's in water, yes? And there's a heat exchanger over here. So looking over here, we can see that when a neutron is fired in, what happens is, yes, the uranium splits, we're using neutrons, and they can then travel into the other fuel rods, causing multiple, multiple fission reactions to occur. But let's say the reaction is happening too fast, you simply can insert the control rods down, and obviously they block off the neutrons, and obviously slow down the rate of the nuclear reaction. So that's the use of the control rods. And over here I've got a table just summarising it. Fuel rods contain the nuclear fuel which will undergo the fission. Control rods are raised and lowered to absorb the excess uh, neutrons. There's also a moderator which slows down the speed of the neutrons so that they can be easily absorbed by other uranium nuclei. So that means that if you like, imagine the neutrons are travelling too fast, a uranium nucleus can't absorb it. It's like someone throwing a ball at you really fast, you can't catch it. The heat exchanger, the heat exchanger is used to remove heat from the whole system, so therefore it doesn't um, overheat. And then shielding is the concrete shielding on top, just to prevent the radiation from escaping. Nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the other process. So rather than having nuclear splitting and releasing energy, you can take two lighter nuclei, combine them into one which is heavier, and that will release energy. It's almost like the reverse. So nuclear fusion is a process of when two lighter nuclei combine together to form a larger, heavier nucleus, releasing energy in the process. Okay? The energy comes from the mass difference again. So the mass of these two will not be equal to the mass of that because some of the mass has been converted into energy, which is going to be released over here. The reason why this is difficult is because, don't forget, both the nucleus are positively charged. Yes, there's loads of protons there, loads of protons there, therefore they will be repelled from one another. So therefore you need high temperatures and high pressure for this to occur, which are really difficult to achieve on Earth. Nuclear fusion, though, can be found naturally within the, all the stars. So all the stars are powered by nuclear fusion. They are fusing hydrogen into helium. So they get hydrogen, it's fused into helium, and that's what produces the energy which we have on Earth over here. Uh, the differences between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, large nucleus splits into two, releasing energy in the process, the energy becomes from the mass difference. Nuclear fusion, smaller, lighter nuclei combine to make a larger nucleus, releasing energy in the process, energy comes from the mass difference again. Nuclear fission, there's a finite amount of uranium and plutonium available, there's only a limited amount on Earth, but nuclear fusion, if we manage to solve this and actually 
uh, get this working. There's an abundant fuel. Imagine if we can actually fuse water. Water could be theoretically used, could potentially solve the energy crisis. Per kilogram of fuel, fission releases less energy. Per kilogram of fuel, fusion releases more energy. Fusion reactors are easy to get started and the science behind them is well known. Fusion reactors are very difficult due to the high temperature and high pressure. And last of all, the difference between contamination and irradiation. Contamination is when a radioactive material actually physically gets transferred onto something. I always give the example of, imagine a fly, it touches something dirty and it lands on your food, it's contaminated. It's actually transferred the physical matter onto something new. So if something radioactive has actually physically attached itself to you, you've been contaminated. Irradiation is different. It is simply being exposed to the radiation. So as you can see over here, the radioactive material hasn't touched the person, you're just being exposed to it. So there is a difference between contamination and irradiation. Right, so scalars and vectors. So there are two types of quantities. One of them is called a scalar and one of them is called a vector. A scalar has magnitude, which means size only, and a vector quantity has magnitude and direction. So it has a size and direction. Vector quantities can be negative and they have a direction and that direction can be represented using arrows. Some examples of scalar quantities are going to be speed, distance, time and mass. They only have a value, they don't have a direction. Examples of vector quantities can be the velocity, displacement, force, and acceleration. Don't forget force, uh, it can be represented with an arrow, yes, for the direction. So all of these can be vector quantities. Contact and non-contact forces. So contact force, objects which are physically touching each other, uh, and non-contact forces are going to be objects which are not physically touching each other. Some examples of contact forces are friction, air resistance, tension, uh, normal contact force. So like friction, two things rubbing together, air resistance, you're traveling through the air, tension when you're pulling things, and normal contact force when you place an object, let's say on the, on the surface, the force pushing upwards over here. Non-contact forces can be gravitational force. Yes, the way of gravity, uh, let's say a moon is being attracted by a planet. Yes, they're not touching, but there's a force between them. Electrostatic, so two charged particles, let's say one's positive and that one's positive, there's a force between them. Magnetic force, don't forget, uh, if you have a North Pole uh, next to an another North Pole, they will both repel each other. So these are all non-contact forces. Weight, mass and gravity. So first of all, mass and weight are not the same. Mass is the measure of how much matter an object has, and it's measured in kilograms. The weight is a force, and therefore it is measured in newtons. Your mass is the same wherever you are in the universe, so your mass will remain the same. But your weight will change depending on the strength of the gravitational field of that planet. In order to calculate the weight of an object, it's simply going to be the formula. Weight is equal to mass times by gravitational field strength. W is equal to m times by g. Weight is measured in newtons because it's a force, mass in kilograms, and the gravitational field strength will be newton per kilogram. And over here you can see I've got an object over here and that the weight's acting downwards right through the center. The weight acts along the line of action drawn from the center of mass of the object. That simply means that the weight's gonna act downwards from the center of the object over here. The center of mass. So the center of mass is simply going to be the point at which all the mass appears to act. So if I give you this square, we can quickly find it by going along the axis of symmetry of here and over there. As you can see, they cross, and therefore the center of mass is going to be right bang in the middle over here. So for this one, it's over there, and if this one, you can see it crosses, so the center of mass will be in this point over here. So when you find the lines of symmetry, where they all intersect, that's where the center of mass can be found. Resultant forces. Resultant forces is simply going to be the overall force acting upon an object. So over here, as you can see, I've got uh, an object over here, this ball, and there are all these forces acting on it. Well, look, we've got 10 newtons to the left, 10 newtons to the right, 30 up, 30 down. Well, the horizontal ones will cancel out, and the top and bottom ones will leave a resultant or overall force of 20 newtons upwards over here. 30 minus 10, it's 20 upwards over here. And don't forget, forces, the length of the arrow indicates the size of the force. That's why the 30 newton one is much larger than the 10 newton one. Parallelogram of forces. So let's say we have two forces acting upon an object. Yeah, I usually try and explain it with like a dog and uh, there's two leads attached to the dog. And if you're asked to work out um, what is the resultant force upon the object if it's being pulled in two directions, you've got to construct the parallelogram of forces. So first of all, you take uh, both of the forces and you shift one downwards over there. So this force goes down over here. The other force goes across over here. And then all you do is simply drop a line from one end all the way to the opposite end of the parallelogram over here. When you're doing this, you actually have to draw it to scale. So the length of this arrow must be of a certain uh, size. And the size obviously indicates the value of the force. 
So when you're drawing it, you must use a scale diagram. It could be one centimeter represents one newton, that is a suitable scale, or maybe one centimeter represents two newtons over here. So when you're drawing this, once you've done this, you've constructed the parallelogram, then you've drawn the resultant force in between. Yes, then you measure the length of the resultant force, and then from here, you can work out the value of the resultant force, obviously using your scale. And you may be asked for the direction, you simply have to measure the angle with a protractor and also quote it. Resolving forces. Resolving forces simply means splitting up forces into separate components. So let's say I've got a 5 Newton uh, force over here and it's drawn to scale, 30 degrees to the horizontal. If you're asked to resolve this, basically that means that you're going to split it into horizontal and vertical components. So over here, basically, you're going to use a scale diagram. Yes, don't use uh, trigonometry, just draw a scale diagram. You simply drop a line across and drop a line upwards and then you measure the length of the line and using your scale, work out the value of the force. So there we go, we have now resolved this force of five newtons vertically and horizontally over here. So don't use Pythagoras or trigonometry when you're doing this, simply use the scale diagram. Resolving forces on the plane, right, so let's say we have the object and it's now on a slant, yes, it's on a slanted plane over here. If you're asked to resolve the force, which is pulling it down right now, which is five newtons, you now need to resolve this parallel and perpendicular to the plane. So basically, if I was you, I'd say construct a triangle over here. So look, we've constructed this triangle, and we can see that now, and don't forget the triangle is right angle triangle over here. This force pulling downwards is now, look, parallel to the plane, and this force over here is going to be perpendicular to the plane over here. So once you've constructed your right angle triangle, you're simply going to measure the length of this arrow, and obviously use your scale to work out how much that force would be and you do the same for the parallel component. So that's how you resolve forces on a plane. You do it parallel and perpendicular to the plane. Work done. The work done is simply going to be the energy transferred by forces. So work done is equal to force times by the distance moved along the line of action of the force. That simply means that if I have a force acting in this direction, I'm looking at the distance in that same direction. So work done, W is equal to F times by S over here. Work done is energy, therefore it's going to be measured in joules. The force is in newtons, capital N, and the distance is in meters over here. And look, on the right-hand side, I've got a simple calculation which you can pause the video and obviously go through it yourself. Power. Power is equal to the rate at which energy is transferred. Power is measured in watts. Yes, power is measured in watts. Power is equal to energy transferred divided by time taken, and therefore P is equal to E over T. That's the formula. Power is measured in watts, energy is in joules, time is in seconds. So make sure you get the correct units down. Also, you should remember that energy transferred is the same as the work done, so therefore power is also equal to work done over time. So power is equal to W over T, where power is in watts, the work done is a measure of energy, therefore joules, and the time is in seconds. And on the right hand side over here, you can see I've got another example. The relationship between force and extension of a spring. Right, so this is a simple practical that you should be aware of. So imagine I have a spring of length L, and we're going to look at how the extension of the spring changes as you add masses to the end of it. So when you add a mass to the end of it, first of all, it will have a final length F. To work out the extension, you do F minus L, that will tell you the extension, how much it is extended by. Then you would keep adding masses at the end of it, obviously it would extend more and more. So look at my table of results. First of all, um, I have the original length L, and then we're going to add the mass over here. Final length F, therefore to work out the extension, I'm going to do the final length minus the initial length that goes in this column over here. Then the force. Don't forget, I don't want to talk about the mass, I want to talk about the force. The force is simply the weight of the mass at the end, which is going to be mass times by gravity. That's this one over here. Then you repeat this, keep adding masses each time here, taking all your values. Control variables use the same spring throughout the experiment. Risk assessment, wear goggles in case the spring bounces off and causes eye injury. And obviously don't put your feet underneath the masses. Errors when taking measurements of the length, ensure that you are eye level with it, so therefore you reduce the parallax error. And then you should get the following graph of force versus extension. It should be going up initially. It may curve off at the end, but you should go up first of all and then curve off at the end. Force extension graph. So there are parts of the force extension graph you should be familiar with. The first one's going to be the limit of proportionality. I always call it LOP. It's the last point at which the force is directly proportional to the extension over here. The elastic limit is after the limit of proportionality. This is the point at which the spring, if you go beyond this point, it will not return back to its original length. But if you're up to that point, it will return back. So beyond the elastic limit, the spring will now become deformed. 
Before it, obviously the spring will return back to its original length. And then if you keep on adding masses, what happens is that eventually you'll reach the breaking point, which is going to be BP. We can call the left-hand side here, this region over here, the elastic uh, behavior, and the right-hand side going to be the inelastic behavior, sometimes called the plastic behavior as well. Hooke's law, right, so up to the limit of proportionality, we should recognize that force is directly proportional to the extension. Therefore, the force is proportional to the extension over here. Therefore, F is equal to a constant times by E. We're going to call this constant K, and that represents the spring constant. It's a measure of how stiff the spring is. The greater the spring constant, the stiffer the spring is. So looking at this, force is in newtons, extension in meters. The spring constant is newton per meter over here. And look, if we're given the graph of force versus extension, if I was to work out the gradient, it's the change in y of the change in x, it's the change in force divided by the extension, which is going to be the spring constant k. The elastic potential energy, so the elastic potential energy stored in the spring, so if I was to add masses to it, hopefully you recognize it would have energy stored. What would happen is that we can work out the elastic potential energy using the following formula. It will be half times by the spring constant times by the extension squared. So there we go. E is equal to half Ke squared, where E is in joules, the spring constant is still in newtons per meter, and extension is going to be in meters. Levers, so this is basically going to be the physics behind how a spanner works or how a wheelbarrow works. So look over here, we have a wheelbarrow, we've got a load on one side and effort on the opposite side. And we've got a pivot point over here. The pivot point is where it rotates about. Right, so first of all, recognize that um, the greater the distance from the pivot, yes, the greater the force on the load. So obviously if I push from uh, down below, I'll have less of a force on the load. So as I increase the distance from the pivot, the greater the force will be on the load to lift it up over here. And look on this side over here, we have a seesaw. So look on one side, uh, I've put a load, it's pulling it down. But obviously to balance it out, I must push down the effort on the opposite side. And as you can see, because the effort is a greater distance from the pivot, obviously it has a bigger effect on the load. Levers are force multipliers, which means that they can produce a greater output force than the effort force applied. So therefore you might have a small amount of force there, but you can get a bigger force because your distance is greater. Moments, a moment is simply a turning force. The moment is equal to the force times by the perpendicular distance from the pivot. So over here we've got a pivot point and this is our beam. Moment is equal to force times by the perpendicular distance. Therefore force is in newtons, the distance is in meters, and therefore the moment is in newton meter. Moments can either be clockwise or anti-clockwise. So in this case over here, we know it's going to spin the beam anti-clockwise. It's trying to drag it anti-clockwise over here, therefore causing the beam to turn. The principle of moments. So for any beam to be balanced, we need to have the following rule. The sum of the anti-clockwise moments must be equal to the sum of the clockwise moments. So that simply means that, look, in this example, we've got A, B, and C, three different loads on the seesaw. We can recognize that the moment of the anti-clockwise ones, which is the A, yes, that's anti-clockwise, trying to pull it anti-clockwise, will be equal to the moment of B plus the moment of C. There we go over here. So the moment of A is equal to the moment of B plus the moment of C. Therefore, F1 times by D1 is equal to F2 times by D2 plus F3 times by D3 over here. And therefore, this proves that the beam is balanced. Pressure. Pressure is simply going to be the force acting per unit area. P is equal to F divided by A, and that's going to be the area in contact with the table. Yes, uh, let's say we have this box, the area in contact with the table, that's the force pulling down over here, that's my arrow. In terms of the units, the force is in newtons, the area is in meters squared, and the pressure will be measured in pascal. But don't forget, one pascal is the same as one newton per meter squared. Gas pressure, so we've talked about this in the kinetic theory video, which I've done previously, but we'll just revisit it again because obviously it's about forces. So number one, particles inside a gas, they travel across, they collide with the walls of the container. Each collision, they exert a force. Because there is force acting per unit area, which is the walls over here, therefore there is a pressure. There is now a pressure over here. The pressure in the fluid, so right now the pressure in the fluid, to work out the pressure in the fluid, it's equal to the density of the fluid times by the gravitational field strength of the planet that you're on times by the height of the fluid. P is equal to rho gh, where P is the pressure in Pascal, density is in kilogram per meter cubed, gravitational field strength is newton per kilogram, and h is the height over here, which is measured in meters. That means the height from the top of the surface downwards, so that is going to be h in this diagram here. Atmospheric pressure, so here is the Earth's surface, and look, the air above the Earth's surface, usually we think about it as uniform density. Yes, equally spaced, but in reality it's not. Gravity acts on all the particles, and it drags those particles down to the surface of the Earth over here. 
So therefore, as you, the altitude increases, as you get further and further up, the pressure decreases. And then we get the following graph that pressure versus altitude, we can see that as the altitude increases, the pressure drops down. So the pressure is going to drop down. Because we're talking about a fluid still, we can still use the formula pressure is equal to density of the fluid times by the gravitational field strength times by the height of the fluid over here to do calculations about atmospheric pressure. Distance versus displacement. So now distance versus displacement. So this is going to be scalars versus vectors one more time. So over here, we've got an object A and it's trying to get to B. So first of all, it moves five meters up, six meters, four meters and nine meters. Total distance is an addition of them all, 24 meters. The displacement is simply the direct route from A to B over here. There we go, and measuring that uh, distance over here. Obviously, because it's a vector, we're going to have to put the angle theta. So distance is going to be a scalar quantity and displacement is going to be a vector quantity because look, it does have a size and it now has a direction. The basics of motion. So first of all, you should hopefully identify that speed is equal to distance divided by time. Yeah, the speed of an object is going to be the distance divided by time. That's a scalar quantity. Velocity is the vector version. It's the displacement divided by the time. So we can have the following. V is going to be the velocity. Displacement is S. Time is in T over here. And look, velocity is going to be measured in meters per second because you're dividing the meters of a displacement divided by time in seconds. That's why it's meters per second. A couple of things you should be aware of is that the average walking speed is 1.5 meters per second, running 3 meters per second, and cycling 6 meters per second. The speed of sound is also 330 meters per second. Just make sure you're familiar with those values. Now, distance time graph. So over here we have a distance time graph. On the y-axis, I've put the distance, x-axis, I've put the time. Hopefully you can recognize that if it's a diagonal line, it means it's a constant speed. If it's a straight horizontal line, it means it's stationary over here. If I wanted to work out the speed, it's simply going to be the gradient of the diagonal line because it's the change in y over the change in x. And don't forget on the y-axis, you're changing distance divided by time taken. Distance divided by time is going to be the speed over here. So, so just summarizing that, the gradient of a distance time graph represents the speed and the higher the gradient, the greater the speed. Acceleration, acceleration is simply the rate of change of velocity. So there we go, acceleration is equal to your change in velocity divided by time taken. That's the same as your final velocity minus your initial velocity divided by the time taken. And acceleration is a vector quantity, so it can have a size and direction. If it is positive, that means you're accelerating, you're gaining uh, velocity. If it's negative, you're going to be losing velocity, therefore it's called deceleration. Right, so our formula is going to be A is equal to delta V divided by T. Acceleration is equal to delta V over T, and A is therefore equal to V minus U divided by T. In terms of the units, the top line over here is velocity because it's final velocity minus initial, it's still velocity, meters per second divided by second is the same as meters per second squared. And we have another formula, which is going to be V squared is equal to U squared plus the two AS. Make sure you're able to use that and rearrange that to make uh, v the subject or u the subject, where v is going to be the final velocity, u is going to be the initial velocity, a is going to be the acceleration, and s is going to be the displacement. Velocity time graph. So right now I have a velocity time graph over here. First of all, we can see that if it's a diagonal line going upwards, you are accelerating because you are changing velocity. If it is a straight horizontal line, it's a constant velocity over here. And if it's going down, it's going to be deceleration going downwards. If I was to look at the gradient of this line, because the gradient of the line is the change in y over the change in x, it's the change in my velocity divided by change in time, which is the acceleration from before. So the gradient of a velocity time graph represents the acceleration. The higher the gradient, the greater the acceleration. So the higher the gradient of that line, the greater the acceleration. Okay, and also if I'm asked about the distance traveled for this journey, it is simply going to be the area under the line. So the area of a velocity time graph represents the distance traveled over here. You can even use the trapezium rule for the area, the half A plus B times by H to do that, uh, where this is A, this is B, and the H is the distance between them. Or you can work out the area of this triangle plus the area of this square plus the area of this triangle over here and add them together to work out the total distance. Non-uniform motion. Let's say you're given a distance time graph and the graph is curved and you're asked to work out the velocity. Right, you can't do the gradient of the line because it's not straight, but you can use the tangent rule. So the point you're looking at, let's say you're looking at the time on this time over here, you start to construct a tangent at this point, and then you work at the gradient of the tangent. So there we go, as you can see, I've constructed a triangle, and now I'm going to work at the gradient of this triangle. So the gradient of this tangent on the displacement time graph, it represents the velocity. 
So make sure that you're happy with that. So I can use the gray of the tangent to work at the velocity from a non-uniform displacement time graph. Also, if I'm given a velocity time graph of non-uniform motion, look, the graph is curved, and I'm asked about the acceleration, I simply have to do the tangent rule again. So we construct the tangent over here, and once again, we'd use the gradient of the line, because the gradient of the tangent on the velocity time graph will represent the acceleration, because you're having the change in velocity divided by the change in time. Terminal velocity, let's talk about the forces acting upon a skydiver when they jump out of a plane. So initially, the only force acting upon it is the weight pulling it down, and therefore the object accelerates. But as it falls down through the air, what happens is air resistance starts to build up, yes? So the acceleration starts to reduce. Um, it's still moving downwards, then eventually the air resistance balances out the weight. So when the two forces are balanced, what happens is the object will no longer accelerate, it will move off at a constant velocity. And this, the final velocity it reached, this is called the terminal velocity because it's the final velocity it reached over here. Then, when the skydiver opens up the parachute, what happens is the air resistance increases dramatically. So the air resistance increases dramatically, and therefore, the object starts to decelerate. You start to decelerate. And then finally, the two forces balance out again, and therefore, the object starts to travel at a lower constant velocity. So yes, it's a lower terminal velocity at the end. Let's look at it in terms of a graph. So over here, guys, you can see that, look, we've got a velocity time graph. So initially, yes, the weight is acting and it accelerates. But as the air resistance builds up, the acceleration starts to decrease, hence why the graph is starting to level off. Then at terminal velocity, don't forget the velocity is not changing. That's why it's flat. And then finally, when you open up the parachute, we decelerate. And then eventually the forces balance out again with that lower terminal velocity over here. There we go. And finally, you hit the ground. Newton's first law. Newton's first law states the following, that if the resultant force upon an object is zero, that means that the forces are balanced, the object will either remain stationary, yes, or move at a constant velocity. So over here, look, if the two forces are balanced, it's stationary. Two forces are balanced here, up and down are balanced, it's stationary. But we also just looked at when the two forces are balanced and it's still moving. But don't forget, it's moving at a constant velocity. So this is going to be Newton's first law. Newton's second law. Newton's second law states that if there is a resultant force upon an object, well, the object will accelerate. So look over here, we've got an object and it's got all these forces acting upon it. Hopefully you recognize that the resultant force is 80 Newtons upwards, 100 minus 20, 80, yeah? 50, 50 cancel out. Newton's second law states that the acceleration is directly proportional to the resultant force acting upon it, provided that the mass is constant. And it also states that the acceleration of the object is inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So therefore, the greater the mass of the object, the lower the acceleration will be. So we have F is proportional to A and A is proportional to one over M. Combining them together, we get the resultant force, which is the symbol sigma. F is equal to M times by A, where the force is measured in newtons, the mass is in kilograms, and acceleration is meters per second squared. Investigating the effect of varying the force on the acceleration of an object for constant mass. Okay, so this is a quite a tricky experiment, but I'll walk you through it. Over here we have a trolley, and it has a piece of string attached to it, and it's hanging off the edge of a table on a pulley, and look, it's attached to some masses at the bottom over here. So what we're going to do is the following. We're going to take masses from the top of the car and place them at the end over here, and we're going to see how it accelerates through here. Right, we're looking at how the force pulling down, don't forget the force which is pulling down will be the same as the force pulling across and how that affects the acceleration. We're going to keep the mass of the entire system constant by taking masses from the top of the car and placing them over here. That's how we're going to keep the mass constant. Right, so what is the data logger? The data logger is going to take some measurements for us. The data logger is connected to the light gate one and light gate two over here. As the car accelerates and goes across, it will go through the first light gate over here. As it goes through the first light gate, what will happen is the data logger will therefore calculate the initial velocity that will go into our table over here. Then it, as it goes through the second one, it will calculate our final velocity. Right, how are you going to work at acceleration? You're going to also time how long it takes to move between this light gate and this one using a stopwatch. So therefore, we can get the final velocity, initial velocity, and time taken. We can work at acceleration as the change in velocity divided by time. How are you going to get the force? That's simply going to be mass times by gravity over here. And look, we've got our control variables. Keep the mass of the system constant by taking masses off the trolley and placing them at the end of the mass hanger. The risk assessment is obviously don't put your feet under it. So therefore, from here, we can get the following graph. Force versus acceleration, we can hopefully see that the greater the resultant force, the greater the force acting on the end of the pulley, the greater the acceleration on the car. 
second experiment, investigating the effect of varying the mass of an object on the acceleration produced by a constant force this time. So this one is slightly different. In the previous example, uh, we were taking masses off and adding them to the end, therefore increasing the force. This time round, I'm going to keep the force the same, so I'm not going to change any masses at the end. So what we're going to do is we're going to take additional masses and simply add them on top here. So masses are added here only. They're not taken from anywhere else. So once again, you're going to add masses to the trolley over here and release it. Hopefully you will recognize that we're going to measure the initial velocity one more time, final velocity, time in between, and work at the acceleration. And the more and more mass you add on here, obviously if this force remains the same, therefore the acceleration would decrease. So the greater the mass on the trolley over here, the lower the acceleration should be. And the control variables in this experiment have slightly changed. We're going to keep the mass at the end of the hanger constant. The reason why is because we need a constant force pulling it downwards. In terms of the results, what should you obtain? You should obtain the following graph, that as you increase the total mass of the car, the more and more mass you add on top of the car, the acceleration will decrease. Don't forget, they are inversely proportional to one another. Yes, because A is proportional to one over M. Inertia. Inertia is the tendency of an object to remain in its existing state. So for example, if an object is at rest, it would like to remain at rest. If the object is moving at a constant velocity, it would want to remain at a constant velocity. All objects have inertia, moving or not. So there we go, we've got a stationary object. Yeah, inertia wants it to remain, not moving. And look, an object moving at constant velocity, it wants to remain moving at constant velocity. The inertial mass is simply a measure of how difficult it is to change the velocity of an object. The greater the inertial mass, the harder it is to change its velocity. The lower the inertial mass, the easier it is to change its velocity. To calculate the inertial mass of an object, we simply look at the ratio of the force over the acceleration. So m is equal to f divided by a, which is from Newton's second law. Newton's third law. Newton's third law states that forces exist in pairs, and if object A exerts a force on object B, then object B will exert an equal and opposite force upon object A. Here are two examples. So over here we've got an object just resting on a surface, therefore the weight of the car pulling down is equal to the normal reaction force pushing upwards. They're both balanced out. And here's a non-contact example. So as you can see, we can see that the earth attracts the moon, but also the moon attracts the earth as well. Yes, that's the reason why we have the tides. They're being pulled closer towards the moon. Stopping distance. Stopping distance is the total distance traveled by the car, which is equal to the thinking distance plus the braking distance. Thinking distance. The thinking distance is the distance traveled by the car from the moment you spot the hazard until you apply the brakes. Don't forget, as you're thinking about it, applying the brakes, the car is still moving. It is affected by our reaction time and the speed at which you're traveling at. The braking distance is the distance traveled by the car once the brakes have been applied. The braking distance is affected by physical factors, not like the thinking distance. Over here, I have a simple diagram in which a car is moving, then comes to a stop over here. So initially, there's the distance traveled is going to be the thinking distance, the brakes are applied, and then it's the braking distance from here. But the total stopping distance is the addition of the thinking distance plus the braking distance, as stated above. Factors affecting thinking and braking distance. Right, so these are the factors affecting the thinking distance, which is going to be alcohol consumption, intoxication of drugs, age, mental health, distraction, tiredness, Factors affecting the braking distance are going to be the condition of the tyres, condition of the brakes, friction of the road, and weather conditions. So look, all these ones are more physical, these ones are about uh, the human reaction time. And over here, what is going to be the intersection? Speed uh, is affecting both your thinking distance and your braking distance. So the faster you are, the greater your thinking distance and braking distance will be. Momentum. Momentum is simply how difficult it is to stop a moving object. Momentum is a vector quantity, therefore it has a size and direction. It can have a negative value. The negative value indicates the direction. Right, so momentum, the formula, is equal to the mass of it times by the velocity. There we go, P is equal to mv. Mass is in kilograms, velocity is in meters per second, therefore the momentum is in kilogram meters per second. Over here, we can work out the momentum of this to be 60 kilogram meters per second, but because I've taken going to the right as positive, going backwards this direction, it has to be negative. So look, the momentum of this one will be minus 120 kilogram meters per second because it's moving in the opposite direction. The principle of conservation of momentum. The principle of conservation of momentum simply states that the sum of the momentum before the collision is equal to the sum of the momentum after the collision. So that means all the momentum before should be equal to all the momentum afterwards. I'm going to walk you through a multiple examples so that you can get your head around it. So in this example, I've got car A colliding with car B. Car B is stationary. And but afterwards, when they collide, they stick together and they move off. Well, hopefully you can see that 
the sum of the momentum before is equal to the sum of the momentum afterwards. So the momentum of this plus the momentum of this one should be equal to the momentum of both of them combined together afterwards. And look, if you check the maths, 20 times by 3 over here plus the 5 times by 0 should be equal to 25 times by the 2.4. It's 60 on both of them. Yes, momentum is conserved in this example. All right, so this one is going to be a collide and separate scenario. So look, this one is going to be car A collides with B, but they don't stick together. They just keep on moving. So this is the before the collision. This is afterwards. So once again, the sum of the momentum before is equal to the sum of the momentum afterwards. So that means that the momentum of A over here plus momentum of B will be equal to the momentum of A over here plus this momentum B afterwards. So therefore it goes 20 times by 3 plus 5 times by 0 will be equal to 20 times by 1.5 plus 5 times by 6 over here. 60, 60 and look, momentum is conserved. Obviously they're all in the same direction, that's why all the values of the velocity are positive. Another example of the principle of conservation of momentum is going to be a collide and stop scenario. That means that two objects collide together and they simply stop moving. Well look over here, we can say that sum of the momentum before the collision must be equal to the sum of the momentum after the collision. So here's before and afterwards. So therefore we can say momentum of A plus momentum of B must be equal to the momentum of this afterwards. Well we know that it's not moving afterwards, so therefore the momentum of it afterwards is going to be zero on the right hand side. The momentum of this one is 20 times by 3 plus 5 times by minus 8. Careful, but it's negative because obviously it's moving in the opposite direction. So therefore, 40 minus 40, yes, it's 0 on both sides. And this is another example of the conservation of momentum still working. Last example of the conservation of momentum, this is going to be a cannon and cannonball explosion example. This is the one I always try and use to explain it. Let's say we have a cannon over here, A, and B is the cannonball inside. Initially, it's not moving, then afterwards, the cannonball flies off over here, and the cannon moves backwards right now. So therefore, we can still do the same thing. The sum of the momentum before the collision should be equal to the sum of the momentum after the collision. So the momentum of this before must be equal to the momentum of this afterwards. So initially, it's not moving, so therefore, the momentum on the left-hand side is going to be zero. But on the right-hand side, I've got 20 times by 1, yes, plus... 5 times by minus 4, yes, which therefore 20 minus 20, they both cancel out, and therefore the principle of conservation of momentum still works. Elastic and inelastic collisions. So an elastic collision, what happens is the momentum is conserved and the kinetic energy is conserved. In an inelastic collision, only the momentum is conserved and the kinetic energy is not conserved. The rate of change of momentum. So over here, let's say we have a bus of 20 kilograms and it's traveling and it comes to a stop over here. Let's say it comes to a stop in two seconds. We have another bus of the same mass, at the same initial speed, and it comes to a stop in 100 seconds. In which scenario would you experience the greatest amount of force if you were inside the bus? Well, hopefully you recognize that it's going to be in the first one. Why? Because you change momentum in the shortest amount of time. So the rate of change of momentum affects the force experienced. So the shorter the time, the higher the force experienced for the same change of momentum. And the longer the time, the lower the force experienced for the same change in momentum over here. So now let's derive a formula for the rate of change of momentum. First of all, we should remember that Newton's second law, F is equal to ma. The acceleration is the change of velocity divided by time taken. We can plug that in, which is equal to mv minus mu because don't forget v is final velocity minus initial therefore the force is equal to the final momentum minus initial momentum and we can therefore say this is the change in momentum divided by the time taken so yes force is equal to the change in momentum divided by time taken and if we look at the graph of force versus time we can see they're inversely proportional to each other and airbags crumple zones cycle helmets uh, cushion surfaces on playgrounds all use this principle. They all increase the time of the collision to reduce the force experience for the same change in momentum. Gears. A gear is a toothed wheel that rotates about their midpoint. So look, we've got two gears, they're round, they've got loads of teeth around them. And look, the small one is connected to the large one over here. We can see that as the small one rotates clockwise, the other one rotates anti-clockwise right now. The key thing to notice about the gears is that the force they have acting on each other is going to be the same but they have different moments. Don't forget, both of them are turning, so they have turning forces. They will have moments within them. So we can then say that the force from gear one is equal to the force from gear two. If you're wondering where the distance is in this, it's going to be the radius of the gear right now. So this is going to be d1, this is going to be d2 over here. We also should remember that a moment is equal to force times by distance, so therefore force is moment divided by the distance. So I can replace the force acting on the first gear 
is equal to m1 over d1, and the force acting on the second gear is equal to m2 divided by d2. Then just summarizing it all, that a small gear driving a large gear, let's say I have a small gear driving a large one, the small gear is going to rotate faster because it's smaller, it's going to be easier for it to make a complete circle compared to this one. The large gear is going to rotate slower. If the small gear turns anti-clockwise, the other gear turns clockwise. This one will have a smaller moment because it has a smaller radius, this one will have a larger moment produced. If we have a large gear driving a small gear, we notice that the large gear will rotate slower than the smaller output one. If the large one is going to rotate anti-clockwise, the smaller one will rotate clockwise. And you have a larger moment input and a smaller moment being produced from the smaller gear. Transverse waves. Transverse waves, the oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. Longitudinal waves, the oscillations are parallel to the direction of energy transfer. Here's a diagram of a transverse wave. The wavelength is going to be from one point in a wave cycle to its next identical point. So from peak to peak or trough to trough. The symbol is going to be the Greek uh, letter lambda, which is going to be the symbol over here. It looks like an upside down inverted Y. And the amplitude is going to be from the peak to the rest position. So the rest position to the peak is going to be the amplitude. Amplitude and loudness. So over here we have two diagrams. We can see that there's a relationship between the amplitude of a wave and the loudness. The greater the amplitude of a wave, the louder the sound will be. Notice they have the same frequency, but we can see that this sound on the right hand side is going to have uh, be much louder than the previous one. Reason why is because the amplitude is going to be higher. Longitudinal waves. So longitudinal waves, here we go. First of all, recognize that longitudinal waves have compression. So imagine I have a slinky spring and we shoved it one side. We know that the springs will bunch up at certain points and they'd be uh, separated out at other points. The points where they bunch up together is going to be called the compression. The points which they are further away is going to be the rarefaction over here. The distance between one compression, the center of it, to the next compression is going to be called the wavelength, uh, or the distance from one rarefaction to the next one over here, that can also be the wavelength. Sound waves. So sound waves are longitudinal waves. Here is a speaker. This, let's say this is yourself. This is the air um, undisturbed in front of you. When a sound wave tries to travel, what happens is obviously compressions get set up. So the air particles, uh, they are disturbed. They bunch up at points called compressions over here. So look, they bunch up compressions, there's a rarefaction, there's a compression over here, and therefore the wavelength in this will be from one compression of air particles to the next one. So sound waves are longitudinal waves. Determining the speed of sound. If you want to determine the speed of sound, simply you take two bricks over here, you hit them together, and you see how uh, the sound wave travels, hits the wall and bounces back. Yes, yeah, so the sound wave goes forward and travels back over here. In order to work out the distance, you simply measure the distance between yourself and the wall. So the distance between that going there, yes. And then uh, you're going to time the time taken for you to hear the initial sound and for the echo to return. So don't forget, you're listening out to when the sound returns over here. The distance, what about the total distance traveled? Don't forget, if you want to work out the speed, speed is equal to distance divided by time. The distance will be the distance there and back again. So you multiply this, uh, the value that you measure over here by two, and that's how you, you can then use that uh, to work at the speed of sound. Yes, because the speed will be equal to the total distance traveled divided by time taken. Frequency. Frequency is going to be a measure of how many waves there are per second. It is measured in Hertz, capital H, little z. Yes, the higher the frequency of a sound wave, the higher the pitch. That's going to be the key thing. So uh, if you have a high pitch sound, the frequency will be higher. Over here, uh, we've got a formula. The frequency is equal to the number of waves divided by the total time. And look, we've got two uh, diagrams over here. The first one, we've got two waves occurring in 10 seconds. And this one, we've got one, two, three, four waves in 10 seconds. So this one is a low frequency. This one is a high frequency. Frequency is the number of waves divided by total time. So look, we've got two divided by 10. The frequency for the first one is 0.2 hertz. For the second one, it is 4 divided by 10, so it's 0.4 hertz over here. So obviously, the greater number of waves you have per second, the higher the frequency. The time period. The time period is simply going to be the time taken for one wave to occur. So as you can see over here, let's say we've got uh, this diagram. We've got two waves occurring in 10 seconds. What is the time period? Yeah, what is the time taken for one wave to occur? Well, it'll be 5. Yes, 5 seconds over here. So the time taken for one wave to occur. Um, the frequency of this is 0.2 because you've got two waves divided by 10 seconds. Don't forget, total number of waves divided by time. So 2 divided by 10, it will be 0.2. And the time period is 5. There is then a formula which links the frequency and the time period. 
the frequency is equal to 1 divided by the time period. Hopefully you can see that with regards to the mathematics over here. So frequency is equal to 1 over t. Frequency and wavelength. So right now I've got two uh, diagrams, uh, one on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side. We can see that um, this one has a low frequency, but it's got a very long wavelength. The distance between peak to peak is much larger. But look on the right-hand side, we've got a very high frequency. There are more waves per second, but the wavelength is shorter. So we can see that if you have a low frequency, you're going to have a long wavelength. And if you have a high frequency, you're going to have a short wavelength. This leads us to the wave speed equation. That's the wave speed, to calculate the speed of a wave, it's equal to the frequency times by the wavelength. V is equal to F lambda. Uh, look at the units, velocity is meters per second, frequency is in hertz, and lambda is going to be measured in meters. Make sure that you are familiar with those units. Ultrasound waves. Ultrasound waves are going to be, first of all, any wave, sound wave which is greater than 20,000 hertz. So this is our human frequency range, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Ultrasound will be greater than that, greater than that amount over here. So ultrasound is going to be uh, used in the imaging of unborn fetuses, detecting cracks in solid objects, sonar when they measure the depth of the sea floor, ultrasonic cleaning, and the breakdown of kidney stones. They are also non-ionizing, therefore they are safe to use on the human body. Ultrasound images. Okay, so here's a very simplified diagram of this. There's a person, yes, a pregnant woman, and what happens is you've got the ultrasound transmitter over here. You put some gel to allow the maximum absorption of the ultrasound waves. They're going to travel outwards, hit the fetus, and the wave bounces back. So a live image is obtained. Ultrasound waves are non-ionizing, therefore there is no risk to the mother. Sonar. So look at the word sonar. It's sound navigational ranging. Yes, and look, that's why we got S-O-N-A-R over here. So the boat sends out an ultrasound wave of a known speed to the bottom, yes, and it reflects and bounces back up over here. So you time the echo once again. So in order for you to work out the distance from the boat to the seabed, they're going to use the formula half v times by t. Why do I need to half it? Because don't forget this is the time of the echo is the, dis the time taken for it to go there and back again. So therefore I only need half the distance. That's why I need to half it overall. So just make sure you're happy with that. Detecting cracks in solid objects. So let's say for example we have a solid block over here and there's a crack inside it. We can place an ultrasound emitter on one side. It will send out a wave. It will travel down, hit the edge of the box at the back and travel back to up to us but also we can travel down and it can hit the crack and return back as well. So obviously we can determine if a crack is present because that echo time will be shorter because it takes a shorter amount of time because it's traveling a shorter distance. Reflection. Reflection is the process in which you shine an incident uh, ray over here, hits uh, a smooth surface and is reflected back out again. This is the incident ray, the little uh, angle over here from the normal out, it's called the angle of incidence. From the normal out to the reflected ray, this is called the angle of reflection over here. The law of reflection states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. I is equal to R. Then reflection and images. So right now over here, let's say you have an object and you're looking at it through a plane mirror. So this is a, here's a mirror. What happens is if you were to draw one uh, ray of light from the top of the object hitting the mirror, going directly into your eye over here, and you draw another ray of light going from the top of the object into the mirror over here and going directly to the bottom of your eye, then you were to extrapolate these two lines. Yes, extrapolate them. So obviously put dashes all the way back through the mirror. They would both meet at one point and that is where the image is formed. This is a tricky concept, make sure you try it with a, a piece of uh, paper and a pen because you need to get this right for the exam. Measuring the speed of waves in a ripple tank. So this is a required practical, this is how you're going to measure the speed of waves in a ripple tank. So you have a ripple tank over here and you have a, a vibrating bar. Uh, it's connected to a signal generator. So what happens is the metal bar is going to uh, uh, hit the ripple tank and inside the ripple tank there is water and what will happen is waves are going to be produced. Okay, you can control the frequency by the signal generator over here. Right, so look, as you can see, the metal bar hits it, waves are formed. But at the bottom, if you were to put a piece of paper, hopefully you can see that you will get a shadow of the waves over here. You get a shadow of the waves from above. Okay, right, if you need to put a meter rule down at the bottom as well, okay. And then the reason why is because you can work out the wavelength. So now, don't forget, this will be continuous and it's really hard to uh, see the waves will be keep forming each time. So you're going to take a picture of the, of the bottom over here with the meter rule. And then you can work out the wavelength of the wave. 
So look, to work at the wavelength of the wave, you simply measure multiple of them and divide by the number of waves that there are. So there is one, two, three, four, five, there's, there's six over here. So six uh, over here, there's total distance. The, um, I measured that value x, that distance, divide by six, and that would tell me the wavelength. Now I've got the wavelength, I multiply it by the frequency, and then I'll be able to obtain the wave speed. The frequency is simply read off from the signal generator over here. Measuring the wave, speed of waves on a string. So right now we have a piece of string over here is attached to a pulley and it's falling down. Here it is. Right, so you have a signal generator, oscillator, string, the pulley at the end of a table, and then the weights at the bottom. Uh, a length uh, over here, which you're going to measure using a meter rule. So you set it up as shown. Uh, you're going to try and work at the speed of these waves as well. So first of all, when the oscillator, as you change the frequency, you'll get different wave patterns being formed. Okay, so the wave patterns that you will see will be the following. So the first one you'll see is one complete loop, yes, for the first frequency, yes. Then as you crank up the frequency, you'll see two loops. And if you crank up the frequency even more, you'll see three loops each time over here. Right, so then we're going to get the following table. This will be the pattern observed, the frequency. So if the frequency you're going to get from the signal generator, you just write them down. They will all be multiple. So this one could be like 5 hertz, this one could be 10 hertz, this could be 15 hertz over here. The length is the length of the string from one end to the other. In order to calculate the wavelength, this bit is a bit tricky, you've got to spot how much the length represents a wavelength. So this bit from there to there, if I was you, just ignore the dash bit over here, that is half a wavelength. So just going up and down is half a wavelength. For the second one, we know that this length will be equal to a whole wavelength. So just look at that, that's one whole wave here. So the length is equal to exactly the wavelength. For this one, it's got one and a half. So this one, the length from one end all the way to the opposite end will be equal to 1.5 wavelengths. So therefore, to calculate the wavelength, I take the length which I measure, divide it by 1.5 for this one, and this one, the length will be equal to the wavelength, and this one, the length will be equal to half a wavelength over here. That's how you're going to get different values of the wavelength. And then to calculate the velocity, I take my frequency and then multiply it by the wavelength over here, and it will tell me the velocity. The electromagnetic spectrum is simply going to be a range of frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. They all travel at the speed of light, 3 times by 10 to the 8 meters per second. They can all travel through a vacuum. They can all be reflected, refracted, and diffracted. On one side, you've got radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. As you go across the spectrum, the frequency increases and the wavelength decreases. The uses of them. So radio waves are used in uh, radio and TV communication signals. Uh, the microwaves are used for heating food and mobile phone communication. Infrared radiation is for thermal imaging and remote controls. Visible lights for photography, fiber, optics. Ultraviolet is going to be detecting forgery and tanning beds. X-rays are going to be medical imaging. Gamma rays are going to be sterilizing equipment and treatment of cancer. The dangers. Microwaves have a mild heating effect. Infrared can cause skin burns. Uh, visible light can cause temporary blindness. Ultraviolet premature aging of the skin slash skin cancer. X-rays can cause cancer and gamma rays can cause cancer as well. Note that ultraviolet X-rays and gamma are all forms of ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation can cause mutations in the DNA within a cell, which can therefore cause uh, cancer to be formed. X-rays. So first of all, just a flip, little focus upon X-rays. X-rays are further down the spectrum over here. They're electromagnetic waves with a high frequency and short wavelength. They are a form of ionizing radiation. They can cause mutations lead to cancer, but they can pass through uh, certain materials and they are absorbed by certain materials. Hence why they are used in medical imaging. So now, how on earth are x-rays obtained? So this is going to be a 2D x-ray. So what happens is you place the subject uh, on, like, let's say, uh, a piece of paper. This is going to be an uh, x-ray imaging paper. And what happens is you're going to bombard it with x-rays uh, downwards. What will happen is um, that the x-rays can pass through certain materials, such as uh, tissue. It can pass through it. But the bone, it cannot pass through because the bone is, has, is a greater density. So as you can see, look over here. So the points of the sheet which are hit by the x-ray turn black. And as you can see, uh, the x-rays can pass through the skin, hence why um, it turns black underneath where the skin is meant to be. But the bone over here blocks the x-rays over here, hence why the paper underneath is untouched. That's why it remains white. There we go. So the, the reason why the sheet of paper turns black is because it's been hit by an x-ray. If it looks white, it's because it has not been hit by the x-ray. It remains as before. And that's how an x-ray works. 
So X-rays can pass through certain materials only simply because of the density. The greater the density, the less likelihood the X-ray can pass through it. But if the sheet gets hit by the X-ray, it turns black. CT scans. CT scans. CT stands for computerized tomography scans. Consists of objects being bombarded with from X-rays in multiple directions. Multiple directions right now, not just from one way. From multiple directions, uh, uh, you're going to get bombarded by X-rays. And it has it on a rotating camera over here. The data is then compiled together. The reason why is because now you can get a 3D image. Previously, it was a 2D image, yes, or top down. But now, look, you can get a 3D image. Pros and cons, X-rays have a shorter burst of ionizing radiation. There's less exposure. It's a 2D image generated. There's less detail in the images. CT scans multiple bursts of ionizing radiation. There's a greater risk to the patient. A 3D image is created. The image can be rotated, but there's greater detail in the image. Visible light consists of the following colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Richard of York gave battle in vain. Yes, so on one side, red has the longest wavelength, violet side has the shortest. So the frequency is increasing and the wavelength is decreasing as you go across. Then here is the color spectrum. So there are three primary colors, red, green, and blue, RGB. Uh, so there we go. Uh, secondary colors, so red and green, the intersection will be yellow. Yes, red and blue, the intersection will be magenta. Green and blue, the intersection will be cyan over here, and all of them interacting with each other will produce white light over here. Now, why do some objects look a certain color? Right, so the rule is this, objects of color X will reflect color X and absorb all other colors, right? So what that means is this, if I have a blue object, it can only reflect blue light. Yes, it, because the object is blue, it can reflect blue light. So if I shine white light onto a blue object, the blue light is reflected, hence why the object looks blue. If I shine white light onto a red object, uh, red is reflected, uh, hence why the object looks red. If I shine white light onto a green object, the green object can reflect the green light, hence why it looks green. But let's look at it within a bit more complex uh, cases. So over here, if I have a cyan object and I shine cyan light into it, what happens is obviously the cyan can reflect the green and blue, hence why it can uh, reflect the green and blue, and therefore the object looks cyan. If I have a blue object and I shine a uh, cyan light onto it, green and blue, what will happen is only the blue is reflected. Yes, so uh, a blue object under cyan light will look blue. And let's say, for example, if I have a cyan going onto a red object, what color will the red object look? Well, don't forget the red object cannot reflect green or blue, so therefore it looks black. And if I have, there we go, another example, cyan over here, green and blue light being shone onto a magenta object, First of all, the magenta can only reflect blue and red, therefore it absorbs the green and only reflects the blue. So the magenta object will look blue under this light. Two more examples, let's say I have a yellow object and I shine red light onto it. Don't forget, the yellow object can reflect the red and the green, so therefore it can reflect the red. Excellent stuff. Then if I have a cyan object and we shine red light onto it, the object cannot reflect the red, it can only reflect the green and blue, therefore this object looks black and nothing is reflected. Colors and filters now. So colors and filters. So a filter simply only lets uh, certain colors through it. So let's say, for example, if I have white light onto a blue filter, the blue filter will um, only allow the blue to pass through. If I have white light onto the red filter, only the red one can pass through. And over here, if onto a green filter, only the green one can pass through. So hopefully that makes sense. And look at the bottom example. If I have blue light onto the red uh, filter, what will happen is that uh, the red filter will absorb the blue and nothing will pass through. Then we've got a couple examples over here. Let's say I've got uh, white light onto a cyan filter. Obviously the green and blue pass through and the red is not. If I've got white light onto a yellow filter, obviously the red and green can pass through but not the blue. And look, if I've got two filters, one in front of the other, and I shine white light into it, so red, the green and blue, which is in white light, go into the magenta filter, the red and green can pass through, but if I put, place another red filter in front of it, only the red one can pass through. Seismic waves is another word for earthquake waves. Right, so you've got to be able to be aware of the structure of the earth. On the outside, we've got a solid crust, then we've got a solid mantle, then we've got an outer core made out of liquid, then an inner core made out of solid. Then from here, we've got an, uh, if an earthquake occurs over there, uh, the epicenter is the point directly above the earthquake's origin where it hits the surface. So the earthquake's origin is over here, and this is the point of the surface right above it. So this is the earthquake origin, this is the epicenter. 
Um, seismic waves, there are two types of waves. There are P waves and S waves. The P waves arrive first and then the S waves arrive afterwards. The P waves are longitudinal, the S waves are transverse. P waves are faster, that's why they arrive first. Yes, S waves are slower, that's why they arrive second. The P waves can travel through solids and liquids, the S waves can only travel through solids only. And look, I've got this diagram over here, let's say the earthquake occurs there, P waves will travel upwards, hit the earth's surface, and S waves will also travel upwards and hit the earth's surface over here. But let's say we have an earthquake on one side of the earth over here. Um, first of all, we can see that the P waves can travel through everything. Yes, the reason why, P waves can travel through solids and liquids. But S waves cannot do the same thing. They are not doing the same thing over here. We can see that if an earthquake occurs, the S waves take a different path. They cannot pass through the outer liquid core. So that's why there is a shadow zone over here where no S waves are detected. Distance calculations. So let's say, for example, an earthquake occurs over here and it travels and hits the surface. First of all, we know that the distance the P wave travels will be the same as the distance the S wave travels over here. So therefore we can write DP is equal to DS. And let's say there's a time interval. Let's say um, the S wave arrives X seconds after the P wave. Therefore we can say that the TS, the time taken for the S wave to arrive is equal to TP plus X. So therefore I can plug it into our formula. So we can see that velocity of the P wave times by the time of the P wave is equal to the velocity of the S wave times by the time of the P wave plus X. Don't forget this is the time of the S wave, which we said up above over here. Make sure you can see that relationship and you can manipulate it and rearrange it if required. Location of earthquakes and triangulation. So let's say we have three seismometers which are going to detect the earthquakes. First of all, the seismometer can only tell you how far away it is. So it could be anywhere along this line. But if you put three of them up to find the location of the earthquake, it will be where all of the lines intersect. So this point over here, that will tell me the exact location of the earthquake. Refraction. Refraction is going to be the process in which a wave changes direction as it enters a new medium due to a change in speed. So right now we've got, um, let's say, a boundary between air and glass. The wave is traveling, hitting it, then going to refract. Yes, it's going to refract over here. We can see that as you go from less dense to more dense, you bend towards normal. And as you can see that if we're going for the reverse, if we're going from more dense to less dense, you bend away from the normal. So if you're going from less dense to more, your speed decreases, yes, and you bend towards normal. And as you go from more dense to less, your speed will increase, yes, and you bend away from the normal. Uh, investigating reflection and refraction. So this is a required practical. You need a perspex block, a ray box, plain paper, ruler, protractor. You're required to look at how refraction takes place and reflection. So you shine the, you draw, place a, the block onto a piece of paper, you draw around it. There we go. Uh, and then you mark where the ray of light is going to enter by the ray box and you mark where it's going to exit uh, from the glass block. Then once you're done with that, you remove the glass block, you connect the line over here, and then you can measure the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction, yes, which is this angle, and the angle of reflection. So don't forget you're taking the angle of incidence, angle of reflection, and angle of refraction. This is quite a tricky practical. Make sure that you state that you have to remove the block and then connect the line. The risk assessment, do not look directly into the ray box. It can cause temporary blindness. Control variables, you must keep the perspex block the same throughout the experiment. Sources of error, difficulty in identifying the midpoint of the ray of light when marking, uh, because it's quite difficult when you're using the ray box. And uh, when there's very small angles, it might be difficult for you to take those measurements. Here's some sample results. Let's say, for example, this is going to be angle of instance, angle of reflection. These two angles should be the same. Yes, because they should obey the law of reflection. But for the next one, for the angle of instance and the angle of refraction, this one over here, we can see that as the angle of instance increases, you keep increasing the angle of instance each time. Don't forget you're going to increase each time and record the different values. The angle of refraction will be increasing, but will always be a bit lower. So as you can see, it's going to zero, it's lower, it's lower over here. So the first set of data will give me this graph, and the second set of data will give me this graph over here. Lenses. There are two types of lenses, converging lenses and diverging lenses. Converging lenses are also called convex lenses and diverging lenses are also called concave. These are my symbols which you will see. Yes, the arrows pointing outwards will be converging, diverging the arrows will be pointing inwards. Right, so first of all, when parallel rays of light travel and they go through a lens, they will be focused towards the focal point. If it's a converging lens, don't forget the word converge means to drag them towards. So all these rays of light, they go through it and they converge towards a point over here, then they will separate out again. The focal point is the point where they all meet. The focal length is the distance between the lens and the focal point over here. 
Next one, if we have a uh, parallel rays of light hitting a diverging lens, the parallel rays of light hit it and they, they'll go to spread out over here. Then you might be asking me, um, how do I know which angle they're going to move off at? It's because if you were to uh, extrapolate the lines backwards, they will all meet at this point over here. This will be called the focal point where they all meet over here. Right, and this will be for a diverging lens. The lenses and the eye. So right, this is the eye and it's a lens. First of all, parallel rays of light should enter the lens and should travel down and hit the back of your retina over here. This will be 20-20 vision. But if somebody is short-sighted, the rays of light will just uh, focus too early. So the solution will be the following. You want to spread the rays of light. That will be a diverging. To diverge, it's going to spread it. Hence why you put a diverging lens in front of somebody who is short-sighted. The reverse, let's say if somebody is long-sighted, the rays of light will converge behind the retina. So you want to converge it earlier, so you place a converging lens in front of it. And hence you can see that the rays of light have been converged to the back of the retina over here. Let's say you were to draw uh, ray diagrams right now for lenses. So first of all, this is looks a bit complicated at the start. You have the lens in the middle, you have a principal axis over here. You've got the focal point, F, which is symmetrical on both sides, and 2F, which is double the focal point on each side as well. So the object is the red one. So first of all, to draw this, you draw one ray of light from the top of the object directly for the center of the lens. Yes, going through it. Then one uh, ray of light going directly horizontally across along this axis, hitting the lens and then going through the focal point where these two uh, rays meet. This is where the image is formed. The image will be diminished, inverted and real. Then if we move the object in between F and 2F, we can see that the image changes. So right now, if I move the object between F and 2F and do the same thing again, one ray of light from the top of the object through the center of the lens over there, one ray of light horizontally across and then through F over there, we can see that the image is formed much larger than before. So previously it was like this. Yes, it's smaller. Then look, the position of the object changes the, the nature of the image at the end. So yes, you can see right now that uh, the image is still is magnified, it's inverted, it's upside down, and it's real. The magnification is equal to the image height divided by the object height. So if you want to calculate that, you simply measure the image height divided by the object height. That will tell you the magnification. Next, if I was to move the object in between the focal point and the lens over here and do the same thing again, one ray of light from the top of the object through the center of the lens, one ray of light horizontally across through the uh, focal point over here, Hopefully you can see these two rays of light will not meet. I can extrapolate them both backwards and they will meet at this point at the top, at the top over here. So now look, the image is formed on the same side of the lens. Right now it is magnified, it's upright and it's virtual. It is a virtual image because it is not producing real rays of light and we have extrapolated these lines backwards, both of these two over here. Next of all, diverging lens. So the diverging lens is um, a little bit tricky. But first of all, if we have the object over here, you still draw one ray of light going from the top of the object through the center of the lens, one ray of light going horizontally across, then it's going to move away. Don't forget which angle is it going to move away at. It must line up with the focal point. So that angle, this line, must line up with that focal point over here. And then I extrapolate this line backwards, and where the extrapolated line meets the other line over here, this is where the image is formed. So first of all, we have a bar magnet over here. A region around a bar magnet in which a magnetic material can experience a force is called a magnetic field. Over here, we can see that the field lines go out of the north, yes, out of the north pole and into the south. And that's why I have the arrows over here. We know that there are three magnetic materials, iron, nickel and cobalt. And like poles will repel and opposite poles will attract. That means you put two north poles, they will repel, or two south poles, they will repel. But if you put a north and south, they will obviously attract over here. Compasses and magnetic fields. If you were to be given a bar magnet, you can determine the direction of the magnetic field by simply taking a plotting compass, the ones with a needle inside which turn, and placing it at different points around the bar magnet. As you can see, when we place the compass at different points, the compass needle will follow the field lines. So as you can see over here, it follows this line over there, and this uh, needle over here follows this line over here. So therefore you know that this one will be the south pole because the lines go in. And this side will be the north pole because the arrow is going away. So that's why they also call compasses south-seeking because they're always pointing towards the south pole. Compasses and the Earth's magnetic field. If someone was to give you a navigational compass and you were to take it out, hopefully you recognize that it would always point to the North Pole. The reason why is because that we know that the magnetic field lines uh, of the Earth will match up with the compass needle. So look, inside the Earth there is a bar magnet. You can visualize it as a bar magnet. And look, the field lines go out of the North Pole 
and therefore into the south. Yes, I know that's a bit uh, confusing at the start because you're like, hang on a minute, isn't the North Pole at the top? Yes, the geographic North Pole is in fact the magnetic south and the geographic South Pole is in fact the magnetic north. And we can verify this by using a navigational compass because we know that when we take out a navigational compass, it will line up with the magnetic field, which is pointing upwards over here. Induced magnetism. So what happens when you are to bring a, an iron block next to a bar magnet? Well, what will happen is the iron block will be attracted to the bar magnet. How does this happen? Well, first of all, it temporarily creates its own magnetic field within itself. So look over here, what happens is it makes the opposite pole. So if you have a south pole of a magnet facing it, it makes a north pole and the opposite end becomes south. And therefore it is attracted and therefore it moves across. This is only going to last for a temporary amount of time and therefore this is not permanent. So therefore if you move the iron block away from it, eventually it will lose its magnetism. This whole process is called induced magnetism. Electromagnetism. So over here we have a circuit and we have a switch and look we have a wire going round and look it coils round over here. So the wire coils round going up around the back, down around the front, coiling round over here. This is called a solenoid, a coiled wire. So we have uh, a piece of iron next to it. Right now nothing's happening, the iron block is not attracted. But what happens when we press the switch? When we press the switch hopefully we recognise that current will flow through the wire. Yes, current flows through the wire. Don't forget the current will go out of the long positive terminal over here and all the way around over here. Now current passes through the wire, what will happen is a magnetic field will be induced within the solenoid. So look, we have a magnetic field induced within the solenoid. And obviously, if we have a magnetic field induced within the solenoid, it can now attract the iron block. So the piece of iron will move towards it over here. There we go. And obviously, this is a temporary magnetic field because if I were to turn off the current, it will stop uh, having a magnetic field. There are three ways to increase the strength of the magnetic field. Number one, by increasing the number of coils per unit length, so if I wrap them closer together. Number two, by increasing the current. And number three, by inserting an iron core through the coils is the third way to increase the strength of the magnetic field. Electromagnets and the school bell. So this is the use of electromagnets. Over here we have a circuit, uh, power supply over here. Then as you can see we have the solenoid over there. And this point uh, is just like, let's say this is a metal arm, just a piece of metal, and there's a hinge point at the top. So there's a hinge point. The hinge point means that basically the metal arm can, can move, swing about that hinge point over here. So, and here's a gong and this at the bottom. What happens if we were to press the switch? Hopefully you recognize that when we press the switch, current will flow through the solenoid, okay? Current flows through the solenoid, we know that it's going to generate its own magnetic field, which is why it's in yellow. The magnetic field generated will therefore attract the iron bar, so it will then swing outwards and hit the gong, making the noise. Right, so as it hits the gong and it makes the noise, what will happen is the circuit will become broken. Okay, so if the circuit has become broken, what will happen is the magnetic field will therefore shut down and therefore the metal arm will fall back into place once again and then the whole process will start again. That's the reason why it gets hit repeatedly again and again due to electromagnets. The right hand rule, so linking electricity and magnetism. So um, if you were to take your right hand, yes your right hand, uh, and you were to hold it up, give yourself a thumbs up. So right now what's going to happen is your thumb is going to represent the direction of the current and your fingers are going to represent the direction of the magnetic field. So the current goes up, uh, the field is going this way. And obviously if I was to reverse the direction of the current, the field is going to swap direction. That's going to be important later on. Representing current into and out of the page. A circle and a dot simply means that the current is coming out of the board, yes? The best way to visualize it is going to be, imagine if I was to throw a dart at you, First of all, if the dart is traveling towards you, you'd see a dot, that means that it's coming towards you. If the dart was moving away from you, you'd see the fins which are crossed, hence why we're gonna use the symbol of circle and a cross to mean into the board or moving away from you. So circle and dot means out, and then circle and cross means into the board. So if you were asked the following, so if somebody was to draw the current going into the page, so circle and cross, which way is the magnetic field? Well, take your thumb, point it into the page right now, or into the screen, and therefore you can see it's going to go clockwise in that direction. And if you were to have the current pointing towards you out of the screen or out of the page, first of all, take your thumb, point it towards you, and we can see the current is going to go anti-clockwise over here. So this is how we can determine the direction of the field uh, based upon the current. 
force on a conducting wire within a magnetic field. So over here, we're gonna have a circuit, yes? Yeah? So look, we've got a, a cell over there, switch, and a wire, yes? Connected all the way around over here. We're going to then place that within a horseshoe magnet. Basically, it's a north and south pole, normal bar magnet, which is bent into a horseshoe shape. First of all, recognize that the magnetic field lines are going to go out of the north into the south. Yes, so the magnetic field lines are going to go from uh, the north pole to the south pole. If you were to then press the switch, what will happen is current will flow through the wire. When current flows through the wire, we know that every single wire which has current flowing through it will generate its own magnetic field. So the magnetic field is therefore induced around the wire. So now there's going to be a magnetic field from the permanent uh, magnet, from the horseshoe magnet, and there's going to be a magnetic field from the wire. Both of them will interact and therefore the wire will experience a force. So both of them will interact and the wire will experience a force. We can use Fleming's left hand rule to determine the direction in which that wire will move, which we'll do in a moment. Fleming's left hand rule. Fleming's left hand rule can be used to determine the direction of the force on that conducting wire. So first we'll take out your left hand now. So best way to do it is going to be F, B, I. F stands for direction of the force. B stands for direction of the magnetic field. Uh, over there I'll put down magnetic flux density but still the direction of the field and I is going to be the current. Notice they're all 90 degrees towards each other. You must have the wire perpendicular to the field and therefore you will get the force. So in this diagram over here you can clearly see that the field is going across, yes, and therefore uh, we know the current's going into the page, make sure you can see that, it's going into the page, therefore the force is down. And then at the bottom I've got one, two, three, four more examples in which I've drawn the uh, sideways on view. So obviously over here, we can see the current's going in. So let's verify it. We can see the force is down. Pause the video and make sure you can try these examples yourself. More practice on Fleming's left-hand rule. So over here, I've got one, two, three, four diagrams, and they're slightly different. Look carefully, they're slightly different. What you're going to do is you should be able to take out your left hand and uh, verify the direction of the force. Don't forget when you're using Fleming's left-hand rule, you should uh, do the field direction first, then rotate your hand for the current. So do the field first, rotate your hand for the current, and then you can determine the direction of the force by which way your thumb is pointing. Force on a conducting wire within a magnetic field and F is equal to Bill. Right, if you actually want to calculate the value of the force, uh, first of all, we can use the following formula. F is equal to BIL, where F is the force, B is the magnetic flux density, I is the current, and L is the length of the wire within the field. The force is measured in newtons, magnetic flux density is measured in tesla, the current is in amps, the length of the wire is going to be in meters. And it's only going to be this length within the field over here. The DC motor, right, so this is going to be the physics behind how we have a motor spinning. So there is a coil of wire over here and it's a square coil right now, it's a square coil of wire. We're going to place it in between a north and south pole. Right, so that's my wire, A, B, C and D. And we're gonna pass current through the wire over here, through A. We can see it's gonna to go to the left, up, then from B to C, down, and then back again over here. So now there's a current flowing through the wire. Right, we know there's current flowing through a wire and parts of the wire which are perpendicular to the field will experience a force. So I've drawn this a bird's eye view of this over here. Look, so this is a north and that's that wire, just a bird's eye view. We can hopefully see that um, A to B, the current is perpendicular to the field, and C to D, the current is also perpendicular to the field, but they are both in opposite directions. So A to B, there will be a force downwards, verify it using Fleming's left hand rule, C to D, there's a force pushing upwards, and therefore if A, B is moving down and C, D is moving up, the whole thing will rotate. So the whole thing will rotate here, and that's going to be the origin of the physics behind a DC motor. Right, so the DC motor, this is the full diagram right now. So first of all, there is a split ring commutator over here. So imagine a ring which has now been split, that's going to be the split ring commutator. Um, and then there's a carbon brush over here. So current's going to pass in from this side and look, going to enter via the carbon brush. The reason why we put a carbon brush is therefore that there's going to be a connection but it can rotate freely. So as this rotates round, there will always be a connection because the brush can just swap round to the next terminal. As the coil rotates, we notice that the split ring commutator on the right is going to obviously get to the position on the left hand side over here and will rotate round. This ensures that the current always enters from the same side and therefore ensures a full complete rotation. The generator effect is the process of generating voltage 
from the movement of magnets into coils. Yes, you even move the magnet into a coil or the coil into a magnet, and this is known as the generator effect. When a wire or coil experiences a changing magnetic field, a voltage is induced. So when a wire or a coil experiences a changing magnetic field, a voltage is induced. And I've got two diagrams right now. So the first diagram, we've got a voltmeter and we've got a solenoid over here, just a coil of wire. We notice that when we push a bar magnet into it, we'll get a voltage one way. Yes, so a voltage is induced. The reason why is because the coil is experiencing a changing magnetic field. Because initially there wasn't a magnetic field going through it. Then as you put the bar magnet in it, we notice that the coil experiences a changing magnetic field. As you move the bar magnet out, notice that the voltage will actually swap directions. So if you move the bar magnet in, the voltage goes one way. If you move the bar magnet out, the voltage goes the opposite way over here. So the voltage can be induced by moving the bar magnet into the coil. In order to get a greater magnitude of the voltage, to get a greater value of the voltage, you can simply move the magnet faster, or you can use stronger magnets, or by increasing the number of coils per unit meter. So by increasing the number of coils, you would therefore generate more of a voltage if you move that bar magnet in. Second method to generate voltage is the following. So over here, rather than moving the bar magnet into the coil, we're going to move a wire within a magnetic field. So look, we've got our horseshoe magnet over here, and look, we've got a voltmeter and a wire in this diagram. There is no power supply. You're going to take the wire and you're going to move it up and down within the magnetic field. When the wire moves within the magnetic field, we notice that it will cut the magnetic field lines and therefore it will generate a voltage. So moving the wire upwards will get a voltage one direction. Moving the wire downwards will generate a voltage in the opposite direction over here. There are three ways to increase the size of the voltage induced. Number one, it's going to be by moving the wire faster. Number two is by using stronger magnets. And number three, by putting more wires within the field. So if you put more wires within the field and you move them all, you will generate a greater amount of voltage at the end. So don't forget, you need to be experiencing a changing magnetic field to induce a voltage. Generators. So over here we have a DC generator, also called a dynamo. So a DC generator, the DC stands for direct current. Look at this diagram, it looks almost similar to the DC motor, but instead of a power supply, there is a voltmeter. We still have the split ring commutators and we still have the carbon brushes. So the difference between this one and the DC motor is that in a DC motor, you're passing current through and it's getting forces and they're turning. Now, in this diagram, you are going to turn it. You are going to turn that square coil within the field. So you must turn the coil within the field and a voltage will be induced. And don't forget, because we've got the split ring commutators, it only produces DC uh, voltage. So therefore, every half turn, so when this rotates halfway, we get to this point. Rotating it one full rotation, we do it and we get to this point over here. AC generators. AC generators are not the same as the dynamos. The reason why is because they do not have the split ring commutator. They have a slip ring over here. So look, we've got two rings over there, complete rings this time. Uh, one part of the wire is connected to this ring. The other part of the wire is connected to this ring over here. They never swap over, they never swap over. So what happens is now when the coil rotates is simply, rather than getting a DC voltage out, we then get an AC voltage being produced we get an AC voltage because there is no longer the swapping of terminals with the carbon brushes, which we had previously with the DC generator. So this one, the split ring, the generator, which is AC, will only have a slip ring, a slip ring over here. Loudspeakers, how do loudspeakers work? Right, so this is quite tricky the first time you look at it. So first of all, there is a bar magnet over here and north and south over here going around, and we have a speaker cone in between, speaker cone in between. There are coils wrapped around the speaker cone. So what we're going to do is this. You're going to pass current through the coil. Right, so when you pass current through the coil, what will happen is it will generate its own magnetic field. But there is already a magnetic field from the permanent magnet. The magnetic field around the coil over here will interact with the magnetic field from the permanent magnet. The two fields interact Therefore, it causes a force to be experienced by the cone and the cone will move outwards. Okay, then how would the cone move inwards? Don't forget it's a loudspeaker, it should pulse. So in order to move the cone back inwards, all you've got to do is simply reverse the direction of the current and therefore it will experience a force in the opposite direction and therefore it moves back in. That's the reason why you have the AC supply for a loudspeaker. 
microphones. Microphones are a bit different. So microphones, you're going to speak into the microphone and it's going to generate a voltage. So look over here, we've got a microphone receiver and we've got it within a magnetic field once again. So when the sound waves come in, it pushes the microphone receiver into the magnetic field. So it pushes all these coils into that magnetic field. These coils therefore experience a change in magnetic field and therefore a voltage is induced. So the coils of wire enter the magnetic field and therefore because they are experiencing a change in magnetic field, a voltage is induced. So this one is the generator effect over here because you're going to be generating voltage. So obviously as the sound wave goes in, it generates a voltage and as you move the coil out again slightly, it generates a voltage in the opposite way. So as a sound wave comes in, the movement of the coil is going to obviously match the frequency of that sound wave. Therefore, it converts the sound waves into an electrical signal. Make sure you understand the difference between the loudspeaker, which is basically the motor effect, because you need it to make motion, and the generator effect is going to be in the microphone because you're going to be generating the voltage because that wire is experiencing a change in magnetic field. Transformers. So, basics of transformers. First of all, if you want to transmit electricity from a power station to your home, surely you need a very large cable, yes? But if you were to use a high current to do this, what happens is when high current passes through a wire, it heats up, and when the wire heats up, energy is wasted, this is very inefficient. Therefore, we use transformers. Transformers, there are two types. Number one, there's a step-up transformer, and there's a step-down transformer. Don't forget, we're gonna go from the power station to your home. So, first of all, high current comes out of the power station at a low voltage. The step-up transformer is going to step up the voltage to reduce the current. So it steps up the voltage to reduce the current. And therefore, the electricity is transmitted at low current but high voltage. Then when it gets to the step-down transformer, what's going to happen is it's going to step down the voltage to increase the current. So it steps down the voltage to increase the current. How does this work? Well, you can use the power equation to visualize it because as you increase the voltage for the step-up transformer, the current decreases for the power to remain constant. And for the step-down transformer, as you are decreasing the voltage, yes, therefore the current is increased again to keep the power constant. Transformers and how they work using magnetism. So this is going to be the structure of a transformer. It is a giant iron block over here and it's got coils of wire around the first uh, terminal over here and it's got coils of wire wrapped around the second terminal over here. It's made out of iron, everyone. This one is called the primary coil, this is called the secondary coil. The wires themselves are insulated. The wires are insulated and there's a alternating voltage which is going into the primary coil and a voltmeter at the end on the secondary coil over here. Step up transformer. To identify a step up transformer, we know that there are going to be more coils on the secondary coil than the primary. For a step down transformer, we know that's going to be more coils on the primary than the secondary. So look, we're going to have NP represents the number of turns on the primary coil and S represents the number of turns on the secondary coil. How do transformers work? So first of all, you pass current through the primary coil. Hopefully you recognize that when current passes through the primary coil, a magnetic field is induced. Now the magnetic field is induced. Don't forget, this is made out of iron. Therefore, the magnetic field can flow through the iron core right now. Excellent stuff. As the secondary coil is now experiencing a changing magnetic field, a voltage will be induced. So look over here, we can see that as the secondary core experiences a changing magnetic field, a voltage will be induced due to the generator effect. And that's why we have the voltmeter at the end over here. In order to ensure that the magnetic field is constantly changing, I simply have to reverse the current in the primary coil. Because when I reverse the current in the primary coil, it swaps the direction of the magnetic field. You need to have a changing magnetic field in order to have a voltage being induced constantly. Transformer equations. There is an equation to link the number of turns in the primary and number of turns in secondary, and the voltage in the primary and the voltage in the secondary. It will be the following. NP over NS is equal to VP over VS where VP is the voltage in the primary coil, VS is the voltage in the secondary coil, NP is the number of turns in the primary coil, and NS is the number of turns on the secondary coil. There is another formula relating the current and voltage in both the primary and secondary coils. First of all, the power entering it must be the same as the power out. We also know that power is equal to current times by voltage. Therefore, the current in the primary times by the voltage in the primary will be equal to the current in the secondary times by the voltage in the secondary. 
So the sun is our nearest star, all the planets in the solar system orbit around it. We've got the sun over here, we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. There used to be a planet called Pluto, but it got demoted. So I memorized the following. My very easy method just sums up nine planets, but obviously Pluto is not longer a planet, so you can just remove that. We have the inner planets over here and the outer planets over here, and they are separated by the asteroid belt. Orbits. When an object goes around another object in a circle, we know this is going to be experiencing circular motion. So this whole thing is called circular motion because it's moving around in a circle. Right, uh, the force pulling you to the centre of the circle is called the centripetal force. For the Earth going around the Sun, we know that centripetal force is going to be provided by gravity. Gravity is going to be pulling it inwards. We can see that as the object moves around, that its velocity is changing because it's changing direction over here. So we can say that it's being pulled in one direction and being pulled in one direction over here, so that's the reason why it moves in a circle. Although the Earth is moving at a constant speed, it will be accelerating. The reason why is because acceleration is going to be a change in velocity divided by the time taken. And although it's moving at a constant speed, the reason why the velocity is changing is because the direction is constantly changing. So as you have a change in velocity divided by time taken, therefore it will be accelerating. So therefore objects moving in circular motion will be accelerating inwards. Orbital velocity. If you want to work out the orbital velocity of an object, basically it's going to be the distance traveled in one rotation divided by the time taken. So we have the Earth going around the Sun, the distance traveled in one rotation is going to be the circumference of the circle, which is going to be 2 pi r. The time taken for it to go around is going to be the time period capital T over here. That's why to calculate the orbital velocity it will be 2 pi r divided by t, where r is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. Satellites. There are two types of satellites, naturally occurring satellites and artificial satellites. Natural satellites are going to be the planets, the moon, because the moon is a natural satellite of the Earth, the planet is a natural satellite of the Sun. Artificial satellites are man-made and they've been placed up there by the human race. Um, geostationary. Geostationary, look, the key is in the wording. Geo means the Earth, stationary means not moving. Geostationary satellites stay above the Earth in the same position. It has the time period as the time period of the Earth's rotation. So it rotates with the Earth. So let's say this is the Earth over here, my calculator. The satellite will be my hand over here. So as the Earth rotates, the satellite stays in the same position above the Earth. There we go. So it rotates in the same position. Its use will be in communication satellites. Because uh, let's say for mobile phones, you always want to have reception. So you always want the satellite directly above you in the same position. Polar orbits. Polar orbits are different. Polar orbits... As the Earth turns around, yes, first of all, it doesn't move with it. It actually sweeps from pole to pole. So let's say the Earth is rotating round. We can see the satellite is going to sweep from pole to pole. The reason why you want this is because it can be used to cover the entire world. Uh, it's useful in weather mapping and for spying on other countries because therefore you can actually uh, look at what every other country is doing. The life cycle of a star. So this is the life cycle of the stars that were first created in the universe. Initially, there is hydrogen dust and gas. Right, then gravity acts upon it and brings it together. It starts to clump together. Eventually, it takes the shape of a protostar, which is spherical in shape, and the temperature starts to increase. No light is given off yet, and there's not enough uh, temperature for nuclear fusion to occur. Then it becomes a main sequence star when the temperature is hot enough. And now we have the nuclear fusion occurring. Hydrogen is being fused into helium. So hydrogen fused with other hydrogen to make helium and energy is released in that process in the form of heat and light. Then from here, uh, the star will spend most of its life in this stage. The reason why is because it has a nice balance of the gravitational force pulling inwards and the force from the radiation pressure pushing outwards. Both those forces are going to be equal, hence why it has this most uh, stable phase. Then from here, from the main sequence phase, it can take two paths. The one on the left hand side is for a star the same size as our sun. It will expand out to become a red giant. Then as the hydrogen runs out, the fusion of helium occurs with lighter elements up to iron. So iron is formed over here. Then eventually the outer layer sheds off, leaving a hot white dwarf. Eventually this will cool down to become a black dwarf. So that's for our sun. Our sun will take this path, yes, over here. But if it is much larger than the sun, it will go down another path. For the larger stars, it will expand to become a red supergiant. As it becomes a red supergiant, yes, what will happen is the hydrogen will run out again. And yes, we'll get the fusion of the heavier elements up to iron. Yes, the helium fusion occurs here. 
Then it will contract very rapidly and what will happen is a violent explosion will be observed called a supernova. This is where the elements greater than iron are being fused. So when you find uranium, the uranium is not formed anywhere else except from the supernova. Now it is formed in a supernova, it is then scattered across the universe. And then from here it can even become a neutron star over here, which is a densely packed star, or it can become a black hole, which has a very strong gravitational pull that even light cannot escape it. The formation of our solar system and planets. So how is our sun formed? Our sun is not the same as some of the stars which were previously created because we actually have hydrogen at the start, but we also have heavier elements from supernova explosions from earlier stars. So earlier stars obviously made these heavier elements and now our sun is going to be formed from the remnants of dead stars. So look over here, now we have all the elements clumping together once again to form a protostar over here. And look, we can see that not all of it clumps together, but what's gonna to happen to all the material that's not clumped together? Hopefully you can recognize that those bits which have not clumped together will then clump together themselves. So the dust clouds which are not used in the formation of the star now clump together due to gravity and these will form the planets and that's how we have the planets. Note that there are heavier elements still in these so you get the heavier elements in these uh, planets being formed. Uh, the inner planets of the solar system have solid surfaces because they are made up of heavier denser materials like iron or uranium. Gravity is stronger close to the sun hence why these heavier materials can be easily brought together. The outer planets are called gas giants this is because the gas substances contracted together further away from the sun. That's the reason why we have the gas giants further away. The Doppler effect. So let's say, for example, we have an ambulance over here. We have a person behind it and a person in front. Initially, if the siren is turned on, you would hear the same thing from both sides. Same thing from both sides because the waves are coming out equally. But what happens when the ambulance starts to move on one, to one side? So when the ambulance starts to move to this side over here, what will happen is these waves get bunched up. So the person on the right will have a higher frequency. So the person on the right will observe a higher frequency and a shorter wavelength. It is a shorter wavelength because the distance between each one is shorter. The person behind watching it leave is going to experience a lower frequency because the wavelength has been stretched out. This is known as the Doppler effect. The apparent change in the frequency and wavelength of a wave due to the relative motion of the source, in this case it's the ambulance, and the observer is known as the Doppler effect. So make sure that you understand it's due to the relative motion of the source and the observer. So it depends on where you are. Yes, if it's moving towards you, high frequency, it's moving away from you, it's going to be a low frequency. Now we are going to use our understanding of the Doppler effect when we're talking about light. Right, so first of all, this is the visible light spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. Yes, Richard of York gave battle in vain. One side we're going to call the left hand side the red side and the right hand side is going to be called the blue side for now. So we've got the left hand side and the right side is going to be called the blue side. Right, now from here we're going to say that white light has an equal distribution of all the wavelengths so we're going to put it right bang in the middle. It'll be like the average. So imagine that red line over here. I'm going to use this red line to explain a concept in a minute. So just for now, just accept that the red line represents white light. Now let's talk about galaxies. So let's say a galaxy is going to emit white light. Yes, over here. Right, if the galaxy is stationary, yes, it emits white light. But then if the galaxy is moving away, we notice from the Doppler effect that the wavelength will increase. Yes, the waves get stretched out. The wavelength increases and the frequency drops down. Now, because the white light has increased in wavelength, what will happen to the white light over here? Well, obviously if you've increased in wavelength, you have shifted to the red end of the spectrum. Hence why we call it redshift. So the white light increases in wavelength, therefore shifting it to the red end of the spectrum. That's why it's called redshift. So if a galaxy is moving away from us, we can see that the wavelength has increased. The white light is shifted to the red end of the visible light spectrum. This is therefore called redshift. And the opposite then. So what happens if we observe a galaxy and we, the galaxy is moving towards us? Hopefully you can see that the wavelength has decreased. If the wavelength has decreased, the white light will shift to the blue side of the spectrum because the wavelength has decreased. So the white light shifts to the blue side of the spectrum. So therefore we can say that the white light is shifted to the blue end of the visible light spectrum. We call this blue shift. So make sure you understand the idea of red shift and blue shift in terms of the Doppler effect and how the wavelength is changing due to the motion of the galaxy relative to the observer. So how do we actually see red shift and blue shift? Well, we can see them via absorption lines. 
Basically, uh, this is a spectrum. On one side, it's red. One side, it's blue. Yes, it's going across the entire color spectrum. And we have these black lines over here. The black lines are basically like a fingerprint for that galaxy. Right, so the one in the middle is not moving. That's the reason why they have lines like this. But the one above is an absorption spectrum from a galaxy moving away from us. The key thing to note is that, as you can see, that if the stationary galaxy has lines like this, and the one moving away from us, what's happened to all those lines? Look, they've been all shifted. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. They've all been shifted to the red end of the spectrum, hence why we know this is going to be redshift. And look, the one at the bottom over here, relative to this one over here, we can see that all the lines have been shifted to the blue end of the spectrum, hence why this one is going to demonstrate blue shift. So by looking at the absorption lines, we can determine if it's going to be redshift or blue shift. Redshift and expanding universe. Right, so if we were to plot a graph of the velocity of the galaxy in kilometers per second on the y-axis and the distance of the galaxy from Earth uh, on the x-axis, we will know that the galaxies furthest away are moving off the fastest. Uh, and therefore, they will exhibit the greatest redshift. Sometimes when you're looking at these questions, they might have the unit of the light year. The unit of the light year is not a measure of time. It is a measure of distance. It is a measure of the distance traveled by light in one complete year. In order to calculate the value of one light year, I'm going to take the speed of light and times it by the number of seconds in a year. So the speed of light is three times by 10 to the eight meters per second. Therefore, I'm going to times it by 60 by 60 times by 24 times by 365, which is going to be the total number of seconds in a year. Then my answer will be 9.4 times by 10 to the power of 15 meters. So yes, one light year is equal to 9.4 times by 10 to the power of 15 meters. Pause the video and check my calculation to just make sure that you understand how we calculate that. A little bit of extra information over here that we know that the velocity is proportional to the distance and therefore that there's a constant which relates to both of them. That constant is going to be called Hubble's constant. The gradient of the line is going to be one divided by time. So therefore, to work at the time of the universe, if you rearrange this formula, t is equal to one divided by the gradient of that line, where t will be the time of the universe. So if they give you this graph and you're asked about the time of the universe, it is basically one over the gradient of this line. So what does redshift tell you about the universe? Well, from Earth, every galaxy which is observed, you will be able to observe redshift. So redshift is observed from every single galaxy. So obviously if redshift is observed, that tells you that all the galaxies are moving away and therefore the universe is expanding. The Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory is the most accepted theory based upon the evidence on how the universe began. The Big Bang Theory states that from one point of singularity, a giant explosion of energy occurred and the universe was created and has been expanding ever since. There are two types of evidence supporting the Big Bang. The first one, which we just covered, is going to be redshift. You observe redshift from distant galaxies. This shows you that the universe is expanding. The other bit of uh, data to help support the Big Bang Theory is going to be the detection of CMBR, which is going to be cosmic microwave background radiation. It's basically the leftover radiation from the initial Big Bang, so the leftover radiation. The fate of the universe. Right, so we don't understand how the universe is going to end, but currently if we plot a graph of the size of the universe versus time, we're roughly over here. We recognize that it can go down the possible route of the big yawn, it continues to increase in size, or it goes down to the big crunch, maybe it will collapse back inwards on itself over here, we're not too sure. Unknown aspects of the universe. So the universe is actually expanding at an accelerating rate. Because it is expanding at an accelerating rate, Physicists are not too sure what is responsible for this expansion. They have called it dark energy because they are not too sure what it is that's causing the acceleration in the expansion of the universe. Dark matter. So here we have a spiral galaxy over here. And what should be happening is that for the spiral galaxy, we should notice that uh, these stars over here should be moving a lot slower than the ones in the middle. So the ones in the middle should be moving much faster than the ones at the end. The reason why is because these ones are closer to the center, so gravity must be acting at the strongest, therefore causing them to move faster. But when astronomers actually looked at the data, they noticed that if you plot the graph of velocity versus distance from the center of the galaxy, that yes, it should have actually dropped down, the velocity should decrease as you get further out, but the velocity never decreased. It actually stayed the same. So the velocity of these ones is roughly the same as the velocity of these ones over here. So the velocity of the stars further out is much higher than expected. Therefore, there must be some extra mass somewhere which is causing this extra gravitational pull. We are going to call this dark matter. Physicists do not really understand it because dark matter does not give out any electromagnetic radiation. 
And that's it guys for the entire GCSE Physics. I know this was a lengthy video so well done if you've actually kept up with the learning and watched it right to the end. Obviously if you want me to go through any of the concepts in detail, if you head onto my YouTube channel you can actually find out the videos that you require to actually teach you the concepts because this is a revision video. If you get still struggling with any of the concepts, comment below and I'll do my best to answer all the queries. Please like, comment and share this with anyone you might think is struggling in physics and it just helps to keep my content as free as possible. Um, yeah, um, I wish you all the best in your studies. Good luck. Ciao, ciao. And make sure you remember that physics is fun. Ciao, ciao and goodbye.